need to come out. At stake, control of the PA House. I came here hoping that there is a damn change. In Philly, there is a crowded field of Democrats in a razor-thin race for the nomination. I think we could be looking at a few thousand votes being the deciding factor. Not leaving any vote to chance, each Democratic candidate crisscrossed the city. It's been a tough choice, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Our crews monitoring the election task force. Under no circumstances will we tolerate interference or intimidation. And staying on top of mail-in ballot issues, knowing... You vote and you make a difference. You're not going to get anything done if you don't speak up and have your voice. If you don't vote, you don't get to complain. Our voters decide. Coverage starts right now. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Natasha Brown. Welcome to our special primary day coverage streaming live on CBS News Philadelphia. The polls just closed just one minute ago as the results do come in tonight. We are giving you in-depth analysis from our political experts, a look at the issues that matter to you, the race that could change the House. Our reporters are with the candidates also vying for the Democratic mayoral race. We are also staying in touch with the election task force about any possible problems out there at the polling locations all across the city. Matt Petrillo is in Spring Garden. He's got the latest on that for us right now. Matt, good evening. Hey, Natasha, you know, I'm told it was very smooth here at this polling location in Spring Garden and many across the city today. And right now, it seems like there were very few issues citywide. Still, the district attorney's election task force was activated in case of any potential criminal issues. CBS News Philadelphia was allowed inside the task force headquarters. We watched as workers answered phones and wrote down complaints, only a little over a dozen at last check. Many of those issues were referred to the city commissioner's office, which oversees the election. A spokesperson for that office tells me it had some hiccups with a small number of voting machines. Only six out of 3,000 of the machines across the city had technical issues and had to be replaced. Voters we talked with say the nice weather and short lines made casting ballots in person a breeze. It was easy, painless. Glad I came at lunch. Local elections matter more than the national election, so it was important for me to at least come out and vote in this local election. Our biggest concerns would be if someone is interfering with people's ability to vote, which we haven't had any calls indicating that so far, but we want to make sure everyone has the ability to vote. And the election task force hotline will remain open until all votes are certified. Reporting live in Spring Garden, I'm Matt Petrillo. Natasha, back to you. All right, Matt, thank you very much. Now, all throughout this hour, we're going to take a closer look at the candidates in the Democratic primary for Philadelphia mayor in no particular order, but we didn't want to ask the candidates to talk about themselves. Of course, we want those who are supporting them to give us a glimpse at why. Dan Snyder is here with more on that. Dan. That's right, Natasha. We wanted to hear about each candidate from someone close to them, like a supporter, like you said. This one tells us why she's backing Helen Gim. The city needs a change. I think she's the change we need. Nicole Hunt has known she's backing Helen Gim for mayor since before the former city council member announced a run. She came and talked to us was like, this is what I'm thinking about, and I'm like, Yes, I support you like it was no question. Gim is one of several former city council members squaring off in the Democratic primary. She's a former teacher, calls herself a longtime community organizer in the city before landing at City Hall in 2016, where she's been an at-large council member ever since. Gim has called for a state of emergency on gun violence and championed an expansion of mental health services, but at the center of her campaign, what she calls her Green New Deal for schools. That's why I am talking about a big investment in modernizing new schools inside and out. I have the I'm the only candidate on this stage with a real plan to actually see that through over the next 10 years. Hunt, yes. a former school cafeteria worker and president of Unite Here Local 634, says she met Gim at school school reform commission meetings. She says it's been Gim's support for all school staff, not just teachers, that has resonated with her. They always talk about teachers, teachers, because like teachers are only uh only like position in the school district, but we have full, full service workers too. But she never forgot about those. Gim has lined up dozens of endorsements, including from Hunt's Union and the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. She has the backing of progressive U.S. reps like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Ayanna Presley, and is slated to campaign with Bernie Sanders this weekend. But her history as a progressive has led to questions whether Gim can serve as a leader for all Philadelphians. Hunt 
isn't concerned. When you say progressive, that means that you're thinking different than every other politician, and that's not a bad thing. Going into today's election, polling by the Committee of 70 showed as many as 20% of voters were still undecided, so this really could be anyone's race tonight. Natasha? Absolutely. All right, thank you very much, Dan. We will check back in with you in just a little bit. Now let's bring in political analyst Eleanor Desi. She has a long career in the political arena, working in the mayor's office of neighborhoods under Wilson Good, among other positions. And analyst Joe Watkins, who has also had a long career in the political scene, working on the Bush Quail campaign and serving in leadership roles in many charities and nonprofit organizations. So Eleanor and Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Always glad to have you with us on election nights like this. Great to be with you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you know, we are taking a look, obviously, at the candidates in the Democratic primary for Philadelphia mayor. Uh, obviously, we know that there are at least four or five that are the top contenders at this point, but it still seems to be a neck and neck race. So tell me what your thoughts are about how close this race is at this point between at least three or four candidates. Well, well turnout matters. So in a race like this, we have so many candidates uh, turnout matters and the capacity of any of the candidates to get their supporters to show up to vote for them on election day is really going to matter in this race. Uh, if turnout is as low as many of us think it is, uh, it's really going to matter. Every single vote's going to matter and uh, they're gonna, we're going to be, I'm sure, counting votes. Well, we'll, we'll see. There, there may be people waiting at, at, at right before 8 o'clock to vote and still haven't voted yet because it's just after 8 o'clock. But I, I think we'll know earlier rather than later as to how it looks. Yeah, I think it's going to be um, absolutely turnout is going to be crucial. And each of these candidates that we are claiming are in the top four, they all have a constituency. But interestingly enough, what I'm hearing is that the number one issue that was on the mind of the voters walking into the polls today, and I spoke to a lot of them in different neighborhoods, and I was down in South Philadelphia this afternoon, crime and education. And that and, and, and every, each one of those candidates has to define what they're going to do. And I, I will say that the people that came out, and Joe, I agree, turnout's going to be late, but the people that came out, they had made a very thoughtful decision on who they were going to vote for. They did not take this lightly. So I think it was a very, very thoughtful uh, vote today. And, um, but I, I think we're going to know kind of early because for the first time, all of the poll books are... Um, they have been uh, electronic now, and so I think that's going to make a big difference. And uh, they were very, the com commissioners were very good about getting, there were 2,500 mail-in ballots that were deficient. They got the list out early. They told the people to come into City Hall, or if they couldn't get in, they might be able to call in and turn them into provisional ballots. So it was a very, very organized uh, race today. And not a lot of complaints, right? That's yeah, the other no, thing. Not no a lot complaints. Of complaints. No. Yeah. yeah, we just heard Matt Petrillo say really not any complaints at all at this point, at least on my polling places. Um, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, voter turnout. I mean, it's it's usually, you know, historically low anyway during a primary. Do you, and if that's the case, if that does turn out to be the case here in Philadelphia, who does that bode well for or who's it going to go against in a sense? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and this is a question we, we'll, we'll know in a matter of hours how accurate we are. <laughs> but but I, I would say yeah. that um, Sherelle Parker certainly had a lot of momentum uh, heading toward the end of the race, and especially among the African American community. If African American voters showed up in big numbers to vote for Sherelle Parker, then she'll do very, very well tonight. Uh, Helen Gim uh, had tremendous support uh, around the city as well. And uh, clearly, if she's able to get her, her supporters to show up in, uh, on election night, uh, election day, uh, she may, uh, may, may end up winning this thing. But, but I think it's still a little bit too early to tell. Uh, any of these folks with a great turnout could end up being the nominee tonight. So, I mean, that yeah. could be Alan Dom. I mean, it could be anybody. Well, the, the other interesting thing about it is that when you look at it, the very young progressives in the city seem to be going for Helen. The older progressives seem to be going for Rebecca. And I think Alan was seen as the business community and the center city candidate. Um, and, and there seemed to be more of a turnout in center city in the fifth and the eighth ward. But you also have a lot of progressives in that ward. So it's hard to say where those two wards were going. Um, so it, it, it's, it's interesting. I think you're absolutely right, Joe, that uh, the momentum seemed to be with Sherelle in terms of the Northwest Coalition had come together. And of course, that's East and West Mount Airy, 
um, Germantown, Chestnut Hill, um, you know, and um, she had the uh, endorsements of uh, Congressman Dwight Evans up there and her mentor, former councilwoman Marianne Tasco. So I know that they were working hard. They felt that was going to be a, her strongest area. Yeah, and we know that, you know, this is the Philly mayor's race is now the most expensive in the city's history. We've seen the bombardment of ads, mostly Jeff Brown initially uh, started out with a, you know, just a barrage of advertisement. Also, Alan Dom, understand he spent at least almost $9 million of his own money uh, on ads. How is that, you think that's going to resonate with voters or does that, does that make a difference, you think? Well, we know them much better, that's for sure. I mean, we've seen <laughs> and heard all about them and, uh, and, and the, the commercials have been uh, delightful for the most part. I mean, there haven't been a lot of really mean attack commercials. For the most no, part, really these not. commercials have been like, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, this is what I would do if I'm elected mayor of Philadelphia. So they, they've been they've been pretty pretty solid. Uh, but uh, again, you know, you've got two mayors, uh, two former mayors supporting uh, uh, one candidate. You've got uh, a congressman uh, and, and a bunch of ministers supporting another candidate. I mean, you, you've got all, you've got a, a national U.S. senator and, uh, and, and other U.S. members of Congress, not from the state, supporting Supporting yet another candidate, so it's going to be really a, a hard-fought campaign. It's a, and, and we'll only find out when the election numbers are in as to who was convinced by uh, by, yeah. by the ads. And remember, this election had more forums than any other race in the history of the city of Philadelphia. There also is, you know, Philadelphia. Sometimes we take for granted we are a historical city, and this was a historical race in that it's the hundredth mayor and the possibility of a first woman. So, I mean, that, I thought that would really resonate with a lot of lifelong Philadelphians that, that would, you know, make them turn out. But, you know, we're hearing about the turnout being light. That's a little worrisome. And you, you, you $31 million spent on this race. Mm -hmm. And some of it was personal money, but a lot of the money was raised. And it was raised outside the city, too. And um, you're right, we, we actually had another mayoral endorsement. Remember, uh, Mayor Green endorsed. That's right. Uh, you know. That's right. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> and endorsements can cut both ways. Because when somebody sees a certain person up there endorsing someone and they don't like that person, what does that do to the candidate? So you have to be careful with endorsements, too. Yeah, I was going to say, they could be polarizing yes. <laughs> just yes. as well right. as they could help That's you. Right. So you got to be careful about That's your right. endorsements. That's Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, we are going to check back in with you guys in just a bit as we continue to wait for some returns to come in. But we know that we have been profiling the candidates for the Democratic primary for Philadelphia mayor. In no particular order, we've been telling you all about them and letting their supporters do the talking about them. So let's get on over now to Dan Snyder. He is here. He spoke to a backer of Jeff Brown. Dan. Yeah, that's right, Natasha. You know, Jeff Brown, not a politician. He said that many times. He's a longtime business owner. So we talked with a supporter who has worked with Brown for many years. Jeff can bring it back. Jeff can do what it takes to get the city turned around. Amina Perez has worked with Jeff Brown for more than a decade. My experience has always been from knowing Jeff from a place of giving well before he ever had any aspirations of running to be Philadelphia's next mayor. So when Brown announced a run for mayor, the local business owner knew who she was backing. Brown is the owner of a dozen ShopRite and Fresh Grocer supermarkets across the area. He served on various boards, including as former chairman of the Philadelphia Youth Network. He also has no political experience. It's something critics have attacked, while Brown and his supporters see it as a strength. I like the fact that he has no political experience because we need fresh ideas. We need something different. What we're doing is not working. What you're hearing at the table are ideas that they never did when they had power. It's great to hear them now. Why didn't they do it when they were city council people? Our plans are the plans that make sense. Brown has campaigned on putting 1,500 more police officers on the street and supporting minority entrepreneurs. But the top issue on his website, addressing generational poverty. We need to have avenues available. We need to have real jobs where a person can make a real wage and be able to take care of their family. 
and feel good about what they're doing. Brown has received endorsements from several police unions, including Philadelphia's Fraternal Order of Police and the Temple University Police Association. He also has support from three chapters of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. But he's faced some controversy. The Philadelphia Board of Ethics filed a lawsuit against For a Better Philadelphia, a political action committee that supports the candidate, accusing it of violating city campaign finance rules by coordinating with Brown and members of his campaign staff to circumvent the city's annual contribution limits. Brown, his campaign, and the Super PAC deny any wrongdoing. All right, now we are getting our first batch of election results in, talking about that Democratic mayoral primary. Take a look. This is about a batch of about 56,000 mail-in votes. And right now, ever so slightly, Rebecca Reinhart leading the early results, 118 votes ahead of Sherelle Parker. They are significantly ahead of Alan Dom, Helen Gim, and then Jeff Brown. So those top five, that's kind of who we talked about. And then a significant uh, gap between Jeff Brown and uh, Amon Brown. But right now, Rebecca Reinhardt, Sherelle Parker, starting off the night pretty early again. This is the first 56,000 votes. And you can see Reinhardt, Parker up top, Alan Dom, Helen Gim, very, very close behind. We're going to keep tabs on these. Natasha, let's get back to you. All right. Thank you very much for the first returns that we're getting there. Appreciate that, Dan. Now on the ballot, should the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter be amended to create the Office of the Chief Public Safety Director and to define its powers, duties, and responsibilities. The director would coordinate the use of resources like personnel and equipment within various city departments, such as the police and fire departments. Now, this measure was spearheaded by City Council President Daryl Clark and unanimously passed by council. This person would be appointed by the mayor, but subject to city council approval. That is a question that is on the ballot. This would be an unprecedented position, a new position to the mayor's, mayor's cabinet. We're going to stay on top of how voters are thinking about this and how they're voting for this particular uh, role here when we come right back. Stay with us, everyone. We're back with you in just a moment. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Be safe, look after yourself, and look after one another. Repeat after me. Apple, table, penny. Apple, um, bread. When you tell people he has Alzheimer's, but he's in a clinical study, it's not so hopeless. Yeah. Maybe. You know, it's like, I hope we can just hang in there and you know, maybe they'll find something, you know. Ask me again. What season is it? Um, it's when, this, uh, when all the leaves down and... I know it's there, but I can't get it. Yeah. And it just kills me. I remember watching Dad interact with the kids and thinking, geez, in five, six years, will he even know who they are? One in 10 Americans over 65 has Alzheimer's disease. Learn more today at brightfocus.org. Finding heart in every beat. CBS News, Philadelphia. When a child is sick, there's one thing they need. A really big cookie. Welcome to RMHC. <laughs> We're not big on poking sticks and beeping machines, but we're the best at playing dress up. We think the tooth fairy should travel everywhere. And while hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be.
Welcome back, everyone. We are taking a closer look at the candidates in the Democratic primary for Philadelphia mayor in no particular order, just giving you an idea as to what their supporters think about them. Dan Snyder has been with us throughout the night. He's going to continue to introduce us to some of the supporters of the mayoral candidates, this time Rebecca Reinhardt supporters. Dan. Yeah, just a few minutes ago, Natasha, Rebecca Reinhardt taking the lead on those early mail-in ballots. Again, very slightly over Sherelle Parker, you see here. Now, I spoke with a woman who worked alongside Reinhardt and says she's been on a mission to get voters to cast their ballot for Reinhardt. Oh, I've been doing a lot of conversion lately. <laughs> Yvonne Haskins is on a mission to get Philadelphians behind Rebecca Reinhardt for mayor. Haskins spent decades in criminal justice and says she met the former city controller while working on Reinhardt's team investigating the George Floyd protest response. She was engaged, but she listened. She was she she wanted to know what we thought and and we we worked as a team. She she pulled that she and her staff. Um, pull that team together. Reinhardt was a Wall Street executive before returning to Philly to serve under Mayor Nutter. She worked as his budget director before becoming the first woman elected controller in 2017. Haskins thinks that leadership experience has prepared her for the top job at City Hall. City Council uh, people only have a staff of six or seven people. Rebecca has run agencies. As mayor, I will bring the departments and the agencies together and say, we, what are the pain points in this process? Why is it taking so long? And we have to make this faster. Reinhardt has promised a citywide emergency on gun violence, cutting red tape for businesses, and targeting what she calls the open air drug market in Kensington. And her ideas have drawn some big supporters. Former mayors Ed Rendell, John Street, and Michael Nutter have all backed Reinhardt's bid, but critics have wondered if Reinhardt has the fire some voters crave in a leader. It's not an issue for Haskins. She inspires me, um, and I'm not an easy um, believer. She has that leadership ability to stand up and see what's around, to see what needs to be done, and to find the right team. So we continue to wait to see those ballots counted. Again, early results coming in, first 56,000. They are leaning. Reinhardt reports of some mixed turnout in some precincts. So really, could still be anybody's race, Natasha. All right, maybe a long night. Thank you yeah. very much, Dan. Well, over the past couple of days or so, hundreds of mail-in ballots were red flagged because of issues putting those votes in jeopardy, possibly. Aziza Schuler is live in our newsroom on what voters had to do in order to make sure that their vote counted and where these votes are being counted. Aziza. Natasha, with the polls now closed, the votes are being counted. This thick stack of papers in my hands is the list of all of those people whose mail-in and absentee ballots are at risk of going uncounted. The Philadelphia City Commissioner's Office tried tracking down the nearly 2,500 people for minor mistakes on their ballot. 142 people submitted a naked ballot, meaning it was not sent in the secrecy envelope. 71 were missing signatures, but the most common mistake were issues with the date. Close to 1,500 people left their ballot undated or wrote the wrong date. Another 800 needed to verify their identification. The city commissioner's office told me today that without those elements, the vote will not count. Every year, this is a problem. People don't return their ballots and they don't vote. Had, um, who had those ballots did not get it fixed in time. Um, they're basically out of luck because polls have closed. It's essentially too late. And their vote will not be counted tonight. We're looking at a live picture now of the tabulation center in Northeast Philadelphia where workers are counting the mail-in ballots. One of the commissioners told me today that ballot envelopes could not be opened until 8 o'clock and that the counting will continue until all votes are tallied. But we will not have any final numbers on how many ballots have been disqualified until tomorrow. Natasha, back to you. All right, Aziza, thank you very much.
Now, you know, when you ask residents what is the biggest issue facing the city of Philadelphia right now, most will certainly say gun violence, crime, public safety. During a mayoral candidates forum hosted by CBS News Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, we asked the candidates about their personal blueprint for change. I would establish a state of emergency that would bring in all communities, all relevant agencies, including um, not only all levels of law enforcement, but our our public health, um, our school district, SEPTA, um, and many other actors to come together to have an all uh, all hands on deck effort. We're going to to be creative. We're going to ban ski masks day one. We're going to address these open bench warrants. Uh, for the repeat violent offenders because they're running our streets with ski masks on, terrorizing each and every one of us. We're living in fear and we should not live this way. I don't care where you are in the city. There is no one who is going to tell me that I don't have a right to have criminal justice reform and zero tolerance for any misuse and or abuse of authority by law enforcement without having those 300 officers specifically engaged in what I reference as community policing. In the short term, I plan to coordinate the city departmental response through the emergency operation center. That's police, that's streets for lighting, that's all the departments on day one. Uh, I also plan to use the specific intervention strategies that have been shown to work in other cities, cognitive behavior therapy, group violence intervention. Uh, th these are strategies that work. I organized the public safety cabinet myself. I did not keep it uh, in the public eye. I kept it under the radar. I had the DA there, U.S. Attorney, Attorney General's Office, FBI, ATF. We had a few meetings with courts. We had eight or nine meetings, and it concluded when I left council. But I would engage on day one uh, this public safety cabinet. Our plans are the plans that make sense. And let me start out by saying every police organization in this city the local police, the Temple Police, the Penn Police, the SEPTA Police, the, the uh, Guardian Civic League, the black police officers, every single one endorsed me. Well, you know, polls have shown the Democratic mayoral primary, primary to be a very tight race. We're just getting some of the returns in now. Let's check in with our Dan Snyder. He is watching them and bringing us the very latest right now. What's it looking like, Dan? Yeah, Natasha getting the first round of mail in votes and it's kind of broken down like the polls we've seen, right? Rebecca Reinhardt, Sherelle Parker, Alan Dom, Helen Gim, Jeff Brown all on top, then a big gap to the next four. But right now at the top, Rebecca Reinhardt about 100 votes ahead of Sherelle Parker, so still very close. And again, this is the first round of that mail in voting, so we're obviously not counting anybody out now, but we're also getting results in for city council races. Three Democrats on city council are being challenged. Ketsy Lozada right now, she's got about a 270 vote lead over Andres Sellen. And then we go down to District 8. Here's Cindy Bass. She's running a pretty tight race with Seth Anderson Oberman right now. Again, early on in these races as well. Tight early on there. Anthony Phillips, he's the incumbent there. He's got a pretty sizable lead right now over two challengers there. And as we go into the at-large, for the Democrats, 27 Democratic candidates running in this field right now. Top five are going to go. Isaiah Thomas, Catherine Gilmore Richardson, their incumbents. Rulandau, Nina Ahmad are not. And then we get down to the last incumbent, Jim Harity. Again, it's the top five that are going to go. So Harity is the cutoff for Democrats right now on the Republican side. Again, top five will go. So right now, Sam Oropesa, he's the only one that's not in. But narrow gap in between there early on. We are still also waiting for results in Delaware County from the special election for State House District 163. Again, this has big, big implications, uh, could have big implications for who controls the Pennsylvania State House. We're going to be keeping a close eye on this one. Just recapping here, Philly Mayor very close at the top right now, really close between everybody in those early mail-in votes. Natasha. All right, Dan, thank you so much. As we've been saying all along, it has been a close race. It was always expected to be with no clear front runner at this point. Let's bring in Lauren Cristella, president of the Committee of 70. Good evening to you. We appreciate you being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we've been talking about this being a close race, and we're also talking about voter turnout during this primary election today. What are you hearing about turnout at this point? So we've been watching tur the turnout tracker that 66 Ward's Jonathan Tannen has done for a, a number of cycles, and it looks like we've uh, exceeded maybe the 2015 
uh, numbers that, that we've seen in previous years. It looks like they're predicting about 278,000. Um, which is not great, but it's not terribly bad. Uh, it will be on the lower side for sure. And what are your thoughts just overall, just about, you know, with low, low voter turnout? I mean, what is that going to mean one way or the other for the candidate who ultimately pulls out a win tonight? It's going to be who gets out the vote, what areas, you know, that usually are, you know, have heavy voter turnout, whether those people do turn out, or what are you thinking about that? We're watching very closely. Uh, each candidate had kind of a commanding lead in different voting blocks. So the, the, the campaign that was able to turn out their voting block will ultimately win. Uh, so we're watching closely as the, the results come back in, but it seems like several candidates had a very good ground game, knocked you know hundreds of thousands of doors and engaged voters across the city. So uh, we're anxiously waiting to see, but it looks like it could be decided with you know a few thousand votes. Yeah, so it might be a long night then, back and forth here at the tight race like this. For those who don't know, tell us about the history of the Committee of 70, though. You've been in Philadelphia politics for a long, long time. The Committee of 70 is a nearly 120-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit that was founded to uh, fight corruption, engage voters, and promote active citizenship, and that's what we've been doing for our entire history. Yeah, and we're not hearing of any problems. We have our reporters at the polls uh, just talking about any problems, any issues there. No problems that we're hearing of. What about you? We work very closely with the city commissioners and I think uh, tons of Philadelphians and people across Pennsylvania use Committee of 70 as a, as a resource and report incidents to us often. Um, and we had a very quiet day. The opening of polls, we were a little... Uh, you know, holding our breath with the new rollout of e-poll books, but that went exceedingly well. We heard actual compliments and praise from poll workers throughout the day about how much easier it made their job. Uh, you, and you saw that there were very few lines across the city, very few vacancies as well. We've been doing a ton around poll worker recruitment, and it looks like we had mostly staffed election boards across the city, which was terrific. Yeah, and poll worker recruitment, that's, that's a big thing as well. Tell me about how important those poll workers are. Oh my goodness, uh, democracy's essential workers. Without the frontline workers of our elections, they don't happen, right? Uh, and if they're not trained and if they're not fully staffed, you get long lines, you get voter disenfranchisement. So a fully staffed, well-trained election board is really uh, key to efficient, effective elections. So overall, we know we've been talking about the mayoral race being a very, very tight race. Are you thinking we may have some decision tonight? It's gonna come down to the margin. If it's between 10 and 15,000 votes, okay. uh, then, we, then we're not gonna okay. know tonight. All right, thank you so much for your perspective. We'll get back with you throughout the night. We're back with you in just a moment. Stay with us, everyone. We know this place by heart. What makes it tick? What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey, Delaware, down the shore, we care as much as you do. CBS News, Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Why is just a starting line? For the true self blooms. Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Jim Thompson was an extremely successful man who touched many lives during his distinguished broadcast career. Jim was president of the Broadcast Foundation of America. The foundation has distributed millions of dollars to colleagues who are facing life's most difficult challenges. And the foundation has created a special fund in honor of his work. To make a donation in his name, simply visit the foundation website at www.broadcastersfoundation.org. Look inside any house and you'll find poison risks hidden in plain sight. More than 90% of poisonings happen at home, but there are things you can do to keep your family safe. Visit the Poison Help website or call 1-800-222-1222, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 
Diseases and injuries that damage the brain can cause severe mood and emotional changes, known as neuropsychiatric symptoms. While not often talked about, these symptoms are common in people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, Parkinson's and MS, as well as brain tumors, infections, and injuries. Neuropsychiatric symptoms take an enormous toll on everyone involved. The good news is that together we can shake the stigma by talking about them and recognizing them as medical conditions that can be effectively treated. We know this community by heart. CBS News, Philadelphia. And good evening, everyone. I'm Yuki Washington. And I'm Jessica Cartalia. It is primary election day in Pennsylvania. The polls closed just about 30 minutes ago. Election security is top of mind. The Philadelphia District Attorney's Election Task Force says it has received just a little more than a dozen complaints thus far. A spokesperson says it had some hiccups with a small number of voting machines. CBS News Philadelphia at the Fillmore and Fishtown. We didn't find long lines at polling places today. Poll workers at several spots tell us the turnout was actually pretty light. The results are coming in, so let's take a look now at the Democratic race for mayor with 27.3% of precincts reporting. Rebecca Reinhardt with 13,837 votes. 27 for Sherelle Parker, 16.4 with Alan Dom. You can go ahead and take these. And Jeff Brown has 11.4%. We will keep an eye on this throughout the evening. Our primary coverage continues on air and online. Good evening. Well, you know, votes are already in and being counted at this point as the polls closed just about a half an hour ago. We're taking a look at the candidates who could be the next mayor of Philadelphia. Dan Snyder is here to talk about Alan Dom and his supporters and how he's looking right now out there. That's Dan. right. That's right, Natasha. We don't want to hear from the candidates themselves. You know, we've heard from them through the ads, through the forums. So we went in search of their supporters to see why they think their candidate is the best person to run the city of Philadelphia. Here's a supporter of Alan Dom. He shows up, he cares. That's it for me. Jason Evans knew he was supporting Alan Dom before the former city council member announced his run for mayor. Evans believes Dom's background, both in business and politics, makes him a unique candidate in the field. Running his business for 40 years gives him the people experience on how to manage a large corporation like the city. Uh, knowing his time in city council, I think, has prepared him for the job at hand. Dom started his own real estate company 40 years ago and has now become one of the largest property owners in the city. In 2015, Dom won his city council seat where he served until August last year. He's being backed by former mayor Bill Green and the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors. Philly native and boxing legend Bernard Hopkins also appeared in a commercial with him. But for Evans, there was one piece of Dom's platform that stood out. I want to teach financial literacy K through 12, including home ownership and entrepreneurship K through 12. And then in high school, I want to take a page out of Cristo Ray and ask those students who are interested, optional, go to school four days a week, on the fifth day, work in a job, get credit, get paid. Kids need something to do, and there's not enough to do. So if they have a job and they got to make a couple dollars, I think that's better for everyone. The jobs program is part of Dom's promise to reduce poverty through entrepreneurship. He's also pitched a 10-step community safety plan and vowed to restore trust in government. But critics have questioned how a man dubbed the condo king and who spent millions of his own money during the campaign can relate to people in one of America's poorest big cities. Evans says Dom has been doing that work for years. During the pandemic, when bars and restaurants were struggling to reopen, uh, the neighborhood especially were really having challenges getting outdoor dining and things. I called Alan's office. He showed up. All right, so let's take a look how Alan Dom and the rest of the Democratic field are faring right now. About 56,000 mail-in ballots are in. Alan Dom right now sitting in the third place behind Sherelle Parker and Rebecca Reinhardt. They're separated by a little more than 100 votes, then Dom significantly behind, basically in the same tier as Helen Gim there and Jeff Brown right behind them. Uh, taking a look at our map right now, we're only covered Rebecca Reinhardt because she is in the lead right now, but we can break this down by region. Alan Dom, who we just talked about, faring very well in Northeast uh, Philadelphia right now. 
Right now, uh, for Rebecca Reinhart, your leader, she's doing well in the Maniunk and Roxborough areas, as well as into Center City and in South Philly, some of the areas we thought she might do well in. And Sherelle Parker, we've talked about where she was going to do well a lot, North Philadelphia, West Philadelphia. Sherelle owning those right now. Again, still very early in. We got our first uh, mail-in ballots there. We're also keeping an eye on things out in Delaware County, and it looks like we got our mail-in votes here as well. Now, this is a big race, a special election for State House District 163, and this could really have big impacts on whether Democrats keep uh, control of the Pennsylvania State House. They need to hold on to this seat, and right now, Democrat Heather Boyd is in the lead. She took about three quarters of those early mail in votes. If Katie Ford were to take this, and if Republicans win another special election in central Pennsylvania, they could flip the House. So, Democrats, they put a lot of money into this race. Republicans, not so much, but you know, right now we're still early in this one. Katie Ford down about 1,500 votes from Heather Boyd. Running through our uh, quickly here, our city council races. Again, this is our at large top five are going to go. So your cutoff right now is at Jim Harity. He is a sitting member right there. He would move on to November. Aaron Santamore, she would be the cutoff in that section. And the three Democrats who are being challenged on city council. Anthony Phillips holding on to his spot right now. Cindy Bass holding on to hers with about a 500 vote lead. And Ketsi Lozada holding on to hers with about a 270 vote lead. So things pretty tight there. We'll certainly keep an eye on those. But very close race here in the Democratic mayoral primary. Natasha, let's send things back to you. All right, thank you very much. We'll check back in with you soon. Now, this has been, again, a very close race as expected. No clear front runner just yet as the night is young. Let's bring in Lauren Christella, president of the Committee of 70. We do appreciate you joining us tonight and bringing us your perspective on this race for Philadelphia mayor. Now the most expensive in the city's history. Tell me your thoughts about that. We saw a lot of outside uh, spending from dark money packs, uh, a lot of millionaires spending their own money to fuel their campaigns. And it um, it is obviously, you know, driving up the cost of running here. Uh, Maria Quinona Sanchez, when she bowed out of the race, mentioned that, you know, the, the bar barrier to entry with these big spending, uh, the big spending that we were seeing across the campaign was really limiting to people who don't, who can't sell finance or don't have the access to those packs. Yeah, and we know that Alan Dom is one of those top contenders there, and we know that he has also spent the most money, at least on advertising and on media. Tell me, do you think that really resonates with voters? Is that what it's going to take to kind of get the name out there, uh, his position, and will that make a difference in the end, do you think? I mean, I think it certainly makes a difference. I don't know if it's the whole ball game, but name recognition, getting your message out, um, even, you know, negative messages about other candidates does have an impact. Um, so it certainly will be a factor, but I don't think it's going to be the only deciding factor here. Yeah, and we were talking about voter turnout today. Certainly the weather was not a factor today. It was yes. a beautiful day. That's a good thing. Um, but we're still hearing certain pockets of the city had low voter turnout. One of my uh, friends is a, a ward leader in the Roxborough area. I think it's a 21st ward. Uh, and usually there's high voter turnout there, she's telling me. But today, not so much. They didn't see that at all. So it seemed a bit concerning to folks out there. Um, what do you think just about voter turnout and how that could make a difference? I think what we need to do in these big elections, when you see you know, national groups flood in in even numbered years, the presidential races, the midterms, uh, we need to do the work of engaging voters in between and teaching them how to access their elected officials and hold them accountable so that they actually see change and see a reason to vote instead of breeding voter apathy from election cycle to election cycle. Um, I also think we had a high number of undecided voters. And some of these we, we assumed would turn into actual voters. Uh, and head to the polls, make their choice. But some may have chosen to stay at home and say, you know, I can't, I'd be fine with any of the top three or I'd be fine with top two uh, and not cast their vote. Yeah, I was just out and about in the city earlier uh, this morning and just hearing people in different shops. I was in different places. I went just talking about, well, we're not still sure. We think maybe this person, we're hearing that person might be good. And they hadn't gotten to the polls yet, but you could still hear how undecided people still were. Um, does that surprise you that there's, they were so, so many undecided voters out there, even with all the advertising we're seeing from these candidates and just the name recognition from different uh, endorsements that they've gotten as well. 
Yes, it was surprising. I mean, typically things tighten up in the in the last few weeks of the race, and we just did not see that this year. Uh, it, it has been a neck and neck and neck and neck race uh, for the last several weeks. And I think that's more a testament to the quality of the candidates, that people would be fine with a few different ones, that there wasn't uh, a strong binary between two two candidates uh, so that you're seeing that they were holding on to the to their undecided vote for much longer than than you would have typically seen. Yeah, and when you think also just about, you know, what you would think would be driving folks to the polls, I mean, the number one issue that we keep hearing over and over again is crime, gun violence, uh, public safety. Uh, that, that certainly is still very much a concern for Philadelphians right now, just in light of, uh, you know, the gun violence that we're seeing and the historic level of that. What do you think? Is that going to be something that you think in the end, when we look at some of the exit polls or when we see who's actually come out and why they wanted to vote, that that might be a big, big factor? I think it's a factor across the board, but I also think that every candidate has offered up uh, their approach to solving this problem and what they would do within their first 100 days. So I don't know that they've really been able to differentiate themselves too much on the issue of crime, though all of them are placing it as their top priority going into to the election day. Yeah, and do you think that endorsements do matter? We've been talking about that as well. I mean, think about Helen Gim. She had some pretty heavy hitters in over the weekend. Bernie Sanders, uh, Ocasio-Cortez uh, being a, you know, a progressive Aggressive uh, supporter as well. Uh, folks like that. And then Reinhardt, of course, being endorsed by three former mayors, uh, Street, uh, Rendell, and Nutter. I mean, does that is that going to make a difference, you think? I think endorsements matter, but I don't know that those types of endorsements necessarily matter. The ones that come with people knocking doors, boots on the ground, uh, and turnout operations are the, the endorsements that really matter. So think about the union endorsements that both Helen Gim and Sherelle Parker received. Uh, those translate the ward endorsements, right? That when you end up on a sample ballot that's handed out at the polling place that really drive voters, especially when there's undecided voters, they might follow the lead of their ward leader. Uh, so, so in terms of endorsements, I would say that those probably matter more than uh, celebrity or national figure or previous mayors might, might count. Another thing that we, we've been talking about as well, just in terms of the primary here in Pennsylvania overall, uh, just the fact that we're one of only nine states that still has like a closed primary, only registered Democrats or Republicans can vote in this primary at this point. Uh, but we understand there may be like 1.2 million or so Pennsylvanians who are independents who aren't allowed to vote at this juncture. Uh, would that make a difference if that were something that the state legislature changed or if there was something that would allow those voters to now take a part of this process? Absolutely. Uh, so many of the calls we received at the Committee of 70 today were from voters who didn't realize they had to change their registration. Um, sometimes when you update your driver's license, you don't realize that it switched you back to independent uh, when you're updating your voter registration at the motor voter. Uh, system. So people got to the polls and then weren't able to vote on candidates, could only vote on uh, ballot questions. And for so many people, certainly young people, veterans are disproportionately independent voters. Uh, they don't have a say in these elections unless they remember to switch and want to switch their party affiliation by the voter registration deadline, which was two weeks ago. So by the time most people are thinking about the election, it's too late and they're shut out of the system that they are paying for, right? Their tax dollars also support these elections and they're not allowed to vote on the candidates. And what would you advise folks to do just to make sure that they know of their party affiliation, that they make sure that they know what they're registered as just going into any further election now in the future? Yeah, the first thing I would do is, is go to the Department of State's website and uh, votespa.com and you can check your voter registration there. You can update it from now. You can uh, choose to wait until the, the next election and remain an independent. And then it would also go to ballotpa.org and sign the petition to end closed primaries in Pennsylvania. <laughs> All right, great. We do appreciate that. Thank you so much, Lauren. We appreciate your time tonight. We'll get back with you throughout the evening. And now let's look at one of the big issues facing Philadelphia, offering young people programs and facilities to enrich their lives and to keep them off the streets. Many say that rec centers and other facilities and programs can do just that. They can keep kids safe. They can keep them out of trouble. Let's hear from the candidates on this and how they addressed youth programs during our mayoral forum in April. Let's listen in. We have to fund the things that we've done long ago, like rec centers with actual programming, lifeguards and pools 
Philadelphia Youth Network that I chaired for a very long time, and, and we helped 200,000 young people get their first internship, never had more than half the funding. I mean, 19,000 children wanted to learn to work, and we funded 9,000 of them, or 9,500. We always didn't invest in children, and we've invested less and less. And now we end ourselves in a situation with violence. We, it's of our own making. And this is a part people don't talk about. It's prevention, it's intervention, and then there's enforcement. But don't forget about the human infrastructure. That's what people like Sherelle Parker, who didn't grow up in the Leave it to Beaver Cosby-like family, that's what I had to depend on at the Recreation Center. The Oak Lane Wildcats, the Philadelphia Flames. We need to support those organizations because they connect with our young people who, for example, are children who have have parents who are incarcerated. I started out working in after school programs and summer camps and that wasn't that long ago and I can honestly tell you children weren't dying when we had access to extended hours in our schools. I ran a program called the Beacon Program and we opened our schools for for the parents and the, fa and the entire family for computer labs, gym, arts and crafts, things in that nature, job training, resume, resume building, and the whole nine. We need those things back. But you, you wouldn't know what worked if you weren't a part of it. And families all across West Philadelphia depended on programs like that. And as your mayor, we would guarantee that we will bring back programs like that. And, and I have to say this. Yes, we have to invest in our rec centers, but have, when the last time you've been to a rec center in West Philadelphia, you can't even fit 10 kids in them. We have to knock them down and make them larger. I think we need to increase funding uh, into rec programming, uh, library hours, uh, making sure swimming pools are open Memorial Day to Labor Day in the neighborhoods that have been long neglected. We need to look at services with, through a lens of equity uh, to truly give our kids something to do. My daughter is in seventh grade in the public school system. I know how important the library is in the neighborhood, the rec center, the playground to her. That is what I want for every child in our our city and that is what we need as city controller I worked with councilmember Gautier stood on the streets in West Philadelphia to urge Mayor Kenny to be laser focused on providing services to the neighborhoods with the most violence rec centers I agree with them I agree have to be open pools have to be open in my education plan I want to teach financial literacy kindergarten through 12th grade I want to teach financial literacy K through 12 including home ownership and entrepreneurship K through 12. And then in high school, I want to take a page out of Cristo Ray and ask those students who are interested, optional, go to school four days a week, on the fifth day, work in a job, get credit, get paid, get a summer job. So that's what I would do, and I think it would really help our young people. Cristo Ray, by the way, last year graduated 99% of their students. 100% of those who graduated were admitted to college. Phenomenal results. This is about the life and the future of the city of Philadelphia. That's why I have spent all my life devoted to transforming the ways that this city actually invests in and treats its young people. Of course it's going to start with schools because that's at the very earliest age where we look at a young person, give them the opportunity to succeed. That's why I am talking about a big investment in modernizing new schools inside and out. I have the o I'm the only candidate on this stage with a real plan to actually see that through over the next 10 years. I'm a candidate who understands what schools look like inside the classroom and out. That's why I've talked about every school a community school, every school a hub for families, to bring back parent universities, to guarantee safe passages to and from schools, to make sure that young people are valued in their fulfillment of their potential and not just seen as fodder for jobs or this and that and funneled into whatever position some people think that they can be when they are 16 years old. This city has failed to fulfill the potential of young people. All right, well, let's get an up to date look at the results so far in the all important Democratic primary for mayor of the city of Philadelphia, the 100th mayor of the city of Philadelphia, with 23% of precincts reporting and 23% of votes in. You see Rebecca Reinhardt there still holding on to 27.3% of the vote. Right behind her, Sherelle Parker with 27.1%. Alan Dom has 16.4% at this point. 
followed by Helen Gim at 15.8%. Still very early on in the night. We're going to continue to watch all of these returns and see how close this race really is going to be. Jeff Brown here lagging at 11.4%. Amon Brown just 1%. James DeLeon, Delcia Gray, uh, barely a percentage there with 23% of votes in at this point. It's 8.50, and we are, of course, going to stay on top of the very latest here, the Pennsylvania primary here in Pennsylvania. Very latest on the mayoral race here in Philadelphia. We've got the latest for you throughout the night. Stay with us. Voters decide here on CBS News Philadelphia. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Be safe, look after yourself, and look after one another. Repeat after me. Apple, table, penny. Apple, um, red. When you tell people he has Alzheimer's, but he's in a clinical study, it's not so hopeless. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's like, I hope we can just hang in there and, and maybe they'll find something, you know. Ask me again. What season is it? Um, it's when, this, uh, when all the leaves down and... I know it's there, but I can't get it. Yeah. And it just kills me. I remember watching Dad interact with the kids and thinking, geez, in five, six years, will he even know who they are? One in 10 Americans over 65 has Alzheimer's disease. Learn more today at brightfocus.org. Finding heart in every beat. CBS News, Philadelphia. When a child is sick, there's one thing they need, a really big cookie. Welcome to RMHC. <laughs> we're not big on poking sticks and beeping machines, but we're the best at playing dress up. We think the tooth fairy should travel everywhere. And while hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be. Welcome back, everyone. We are looking at a live view here now of the Tabulation Center in Northeast Philadelphia. That is where workers are counting the mail-in ballots. Now, votes could not begin to be counted until exactly 8 p.m. when the polls close. So the process of counting those votes has truly just begun nearly an hour in now. We're told that workers will be counting throughout the night until every single vote is counted. Now we are taking a look at the candidates, one of which could very well be the next mayor of the city of Philadelphia, but we didn't want to ask just the candidates to talk about themselves. Of course, we know what they'd say. Let's talk to their supporters and see what they have to say. Our Dan Snyder has more now. Dan. Yeah, that's right, Natasha. Pretty unique approach on us. We wanted someone to tell us why they thought their candidate is best for the job. So here's a supporter of Sherelle Parker. It's time for a woman to be mayor. And I think she's the best opportunity, the best option. State Senator Vincent Hughes has known Sherelle Parker a long time, back to her days working in Councilwoman Marion Tasco's office. In 2005, Parker made the jump to Harrisburg, serving as a state rep before being elected to city council in 2016. Hughes thinks the experience at the state and local levels gives Parker an edge. There has to be a strong, effective relationship between this city and this state. No other person running 
brings that quality to the table. And Parker has the support of political insiders. Her campaign website lists endorsements from 37 current or former lawmakers. Also, support of the Building Trades Council. And Mayor Jim Kenney says he voted for her. It's led critics to question if Parker is too establishment, as many voters call for change. But Hughes sees that experience as a positive. I don't call it too inside. I call it that, call that extremely knowledgeable about what has to be done and how it can get done. When I get to the second floor, I will leverage federal, state, and local government resources to make our city the safest, cleanest, and greenest big city in the nation that provides access to economic opportunity Thank for you. all. Parker pledges to hire 300 additional foot and bike officers to be in communities. She also promised to create a business-friendly environment. But it's her plan for year-round schooling with buildings open longer that stands out to Hughes. That is something that I think is a transformative way to propel the education of our children and, quite frankly, to propel this whole city forward. So we could very well have our first female mayor in Philadelphia history, but those votes are still coming in. So let's take a look at where things stand right now. And Sherelle Parker, who we just talked about, she's starting off pretty well here. Just about 50,000 votes in in the mayoral race. Parker in second right now, about 128 votes behind Rebecca Reinhardt, who's in the lead. Alan Dom, Helen Gim coming in that next tier, about 5,000 plus votes behind them. And then Jeff Brown, he's in another tier third tier there by himself. So taking a look at the mayoral field right now. Again, these are all mail in ballots. These are the first round that we got. We also have three city council seats where Democrats are being challenged for their seat. Ketsy Lozada, she is holding on to her seat right now. Cindy Bass as well, holding on to hers and Anthony Phillips holding on to his. The at large five candidates are going to go to November. That cutoff is right here at Jim Harity. So he would be the last one in right now. Aaron Santamore would be the first one out, but still a lot of votes to go in that one. We're going to be watching these throughout the night. But for now, I'm Dan Snyder. Well, primary day here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as voters take to the polls here in the city of Philadelphia and all across the state. Let's get an up to date look at the results so far in the all important Democratic primary for mayor in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, still sitting here on 23% of votes in at this point, still early on. What we're seeing here, Jeff Brown with just 11.5% of votes, Amon Brown, James DeLeon. Del Delcia Gray, uh, less than a percentage there. Uh, Rebecca Reinhardt still at this point has the lead, but again, still many, many votes to be counted, many more precincts to get results from. Welcome to CBS Philadelphia's coverage of the Pennsylvania primary, everyone. I'm Natasha Brown. Thank you so much for being here with us. Let's check in now at the Jeff Brown campaign headquarters at the Warwick Hotel in Center City, Philadelphia. That is where we find our Ryan Hughes live with the very latest there. Sounds like a very festive atmosphere there, Ryan. Yeah, hey there, Natasha. Good evening. You can see that Jeff Brown supporters are starting to file into the Grand Ballroom here at the Warwick Hotel. The balloons are behind me. The music is pumping. And just a couple of minutes ago, I had the chance to check in with Jeff Brown's campaign. They tell me, despite those early returns coming in, that he's feeling pretty good and he's feeling pretty optimistic. And they say that the night is young. We learned that his mom came up into Philadelphia from North Carolina. He went to dinner with his family after spending a very busy day going from one area of the city to the next. We want to show you some video from earlier this morning. Jeff Brown went to the polls around 8 o'clock this morning to cast his ballot with his family and his supporters after spending months on the campaign trail. He also went to several election kickoff events and visited polling places in West Philadelphia today. Brown, he entered this race last year calling himself the anti-politician. He's a fourth generation grocer. He owns a dozen supermarkets around the area and has no political experience. That's come under attack by some of his opponents, but Brown says that is one of his greatest strengths and he has fresh ideas when it comes to fighting public safety, fighting crime that is, and addressing generational poverty. Now he earned some pretty big endorsements, including the Philadelphia's Fraternal Order of Police and the Temple University Police Association. Brown earlier today told 
told us that the city is going in the wrong direction in this race, he says, is about change. And tonight, he hopes those voters vote for him and that he is the answer to that change. Brown is expected here any minute now to greet his supporters. We're also told he will come over and talk to reporters. So once we get the chance to speak with him, we'll check back in with you and let you know what he has to say. But right now, as you mentioned, Natasha, a very festive atmosphere here at the Warwick Hotel. For now, we'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. We'll be checking back in with you, of course, throughout the night. Now let's head out now to see off a Lewis. He is live at Alan Dom's campaign headquarters at the Continental Midtown in Center City with the very latest from his campaign. See off a good evening. N Natasha, good evening to you. We are at the Continental Midtown at 18th and Chestnut Streets here in the heart of Philadelphia, Alan Dom headquarters. He is known, as you obviously know, as the condo king. He had built a vast business empire, a real estate empire, uh, th totaling over 400 properties here in the city. That's how he made his money. He is a self-made millionaire. Some people think that may hurt in terms of his relatability. He thinks it's an asset because of his meager beginnings. I'll let's show you some video of Alan Dom earlier this morning at 10th Presbyterian Church at 17th and Delancey Streets. As you can see, Dom arrived, arrived with his rescue dog, Allie, who wore a blue T-shirt reading, vote for my dad, Alan Dom. Now, Dom really touts his work ethic. He started shining shoes at the age of five with his brother. He had a newspaper route. He cleaned an office building after wrestling practice in high school. Um, he had a day job when he first got here in 1976, making $15,000 a year, uh, uh, managing a time lock business. That's in 1976. 1979, he heard a radio ad for Temple University's real estate program, got into real estate at the same time that he was managing that business. In 1983, opened his own firm. 1987, he was the uh, real, realtor of the year, and that's really how he began building his business empire. He believes his business bona fides will be an asset, and that's why he wants to be the next mayor. He also has a goal uh, of taking 100,000 people in the city out of poverty, bringing 100,000 new residents into the city to help share the tax burden and to create 100,000 good paying jobs all within a 10 year span. And that's why he thinks he deserves the, the, the citizens vote to be the next mayor of Philadelphia. No plans or no word on when he will be arriving here tonight. He lives in Rittenhouse Square just a few blocks away, so it won't be very far for him to get here. But when he does arrive, we will be sure to check in with you. We'll send it back to you right now, Natasha. All right, sounds like a festive crowd there as well behind you, Siafa. We'll get back to you in just a bit. Thank you very much. Now let's head out to Joe Holden, who's live at Helen Gim's campaign headquarters at the Sheraton in Center City for the very latest from the Gim campaign. Joe, good evening. Hi, Natasha. Good evening. All of the political heavyweights out in the city of Philadelphia tonight really spread out, divided among the candidates here at uh, Helen Gim campaign headquarters for this primary on this Tuesday in May. About 150 to 200 supporters filtering in. We understand Helen Gim, the one time city council member who started a grassroots campaign to challenge broken systems, is in the building. Now, of course, uh, Helen Gim voting very early this morning. Her Twitter has revealed just images of people who have uh, been behind her and have supported her. She said after voting, the experience was surreal. We also caught up with some of her supporters standing right here tonight. Really, it is a division. Some people very active, very long, long active in politics, and other people, really newcomers, uh, engaging on issues that they found to be attractive and some of the things they said that Gim stood for. Let's listen to uh, two folks uh, we spoke with just a few moments ago. As a Philadelphian, though, what's the most important thing on your mind with this election? Um, I'm, I haven't been here for long enough to say a lot, but um, again, it's uh, the public safety is everybody's uh, concern about it. And for me, as an Asian American, um, I just have uh, something is I don't like to be pushed out. This arena thing is really push uh, the Asian American out of uh, Chinatown. I think people are enthused, uh, people are tired, people are just like, you know, they want to change for the city. So they have put in all the work on the doors, knocking. Our, our union has been knocking since March. Um, so they're, they want to change the city. And hell again is that change that we need. 
had a couple of conversations with some political insiders. They uh, refer to tonight as almost a, a New Year's Eve sort of feeling across the city with all of these uh, political heavyweights backing different candidates in this Democratic primary. Of course, with the city of Philadelphia and its largely Democratic voting base, we will likely know the next mayor of Philadelphia in the next few or several hours. Uh, but really, uh, it is a race that certainly important in Philadelphia, no doubt, but this race has national attention. It is one of the most expensive races in the country in 2023, only behind a Supreme Court race, according to the data, in Wisconsin. So we have things nailed down here for you at the Sheraton Hotel in Center City with the Helen Gim Camp. We'll send it back to you for now. All right, Joe, we'll be checking back in with you periodically. Thank you very much for that update there. Now let's head to Kerry Corrado, who is at Rebecca Reinhardt's campaign headquarters at Craft Hall in Northern Liberties with the very latest from the Reinhardt campaign. Kerry, good evening. Good evening, that's right. We are with the Rebecca Reinhardt campaign at Craft Hall along Delaware Avenue. We have the stage behind us set up. We have the balloons. We have the party. We also have the people starting to filter in here. And just moments ago, a little while ago, Rebecca Reinhardt filtered in as well. And this is a look at the moment she walked through the doors. We could hear chanting. She even took time to uh, speak to a lot of the people who came here to spend their time tonight to support her. Everyone is patiently waiting for the results. And we have cheers. Uh, each time we see those results go up on the screen. You might even hear them cheering in the background right now. Now, earlier today, Reinhardt voted at the 10th Presbyterian Church in Center City this morning. The former city controller says she was feeling really good and confident in the voters today. She says she is the person to lead this city through this critical time. Now, everyone here is on the edge of their seats. The excitement is growing and the fingers are crossed knowing this is really a toss-up. But you can hear all of that energy behind me as the supporters cheer for her. We have the TVs on, they're streaming CBS News Philadelphia here, and every time we pop up on the screen, uh, they start screaming. So a lot of energy here, and we'll keep you posted throughout. We are live tonight, Carrie Carrado, CBS News Philadelphia. All right, we appreciate them watching. Thank you very much, Carrie. We'll see you soon. Now, our Alicia Roberts, meantime, is live at Jarrell Parker's campaign headquarters tonight at the Laborers Local 332 in the Spring Garden section of the city. She's got the latest from the Parker campaign. Good evening to you. Hi, Natasha. The party is on here for Sherelle Parker. We've got the music going and the dance floor set up and supporters of Sherelle Parker slowly making their way in. I spoke to a campaign organizer for Sherelle Parker a few minutes ago. He tells me he is optimistic with the turnout and the early results that he is seeing so far, but that with this crowded mayor's race, it is still too uh, close to call and that they are just going to have to wait and see like the rest of us as to the outcome of this election. Sherelle Parker hoping to become the first female mayor of the city of Philadelphia. She's touting her experience as some of the reasons that drive her to be the right candidate right now for the next job of mayor. She has served as a state representative and most recently as on a member of the Philadelphia City Council. Earlier today, Parker voted with her son off Limekiln Pike. Uh, Parker announced her candidacy back on September 7th, and since then she's been endorsed by some high-profile political figures across our area, including Congressman Dwight Evans and City Council President Daryl Clark. Behind me, they just gave some of those early updates touting Parker's early success in this election. The crowd cheering here. Parker already saying, though, that her work is not finished. If and when she secures the Democratic nomination for mayor, she will continue to canvas, hopeful to get to every neighborhood and touch as many voters as possible to build the, quote, strongest and most diverse coalition. She says that is what is really needed, collaboration to induce change in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. We also know that Sherelle Parker will not speak tonight until there is some kind of decision, win or lose, or possibly an extension of needing more time to find an outcome. So it will be some time before supporters here uh, at Sherelle Parker's headquarters hear from their candidate, but tonight they are optimistic as to what that outcome will be. For now, we are live. Natasha, will send it back to you. All right, Alicia, thank you very much. We'll be checking back in with you. Now, polls have shown, of course, the Democratic mayoral primary to be a very, very very tight race. That is still very much the case early on in the counting process and the return process here. Dan Snyder has been watching things ever so slightly change. Dan, what's the latest? <laughs> it has been a slow trickle, but Natasha, some exciting news. We got our first
first lead change of the night in the Democratic mayoral primary. Sherelle Parker, the Parker folks out where uh, uh, Alicia is tonight, they're going to be happy with this one. Sherelle Parker takes a very, very slight lead right now over Rebecca Reinhart. 64 votes are separating them. Uh, this latest update, about 2,000 uh, in-person day of ballots. So ballots cast today at the polls. 2,000 of those coming in. You can see not much change here for Alan Dom, Helen Gim. They're in the same relative area as our Sherelle Parker and Rebecca Reinhardt. They just kind of flip spots a little bit. So we do have a, a lot of votes that still have to come in. Uh, right now, about 24% of precincts reporting. So still a lot of votes out there, but early returns showing good things for Parker and Reinhardt. Alan Dom, Helen Gim, they are sticking in this. And then there's Pretty sizable gap to Jeff Brown from Jeff Brown to Amon Brown. Sizable gap after that. Taking a look at uh, uh, some of the city council races. Ketsy Lozada, she's trying to hold her seat. No change in that race in District 7. District 8, Cindy Bass. Little bit of change there. 500 votes right now separating Cindy Bass from her challenger, Seth Anderson Oberman. And in District 9, Anthony Phillips, he's holding on to a pretty decent lead there. He's got about 1,800 vote lead on his challengers. Democratic at large, five of these 27 candidates will go. Isaiah Thomas, Catherine Gilmore Richardson, they're looking to get back in their at large seats, doing a good job right now. Rue Landau, Nina Ahmad, not on city council. Jim Harrity is. And he would be the cutoff line right now. So if this race ended, Jim Harrity is in. Aaron Santamore is out, but certainly not over yet. Republican side, they're also running at larges right now. Look at this. Top of the ticket, Drew Murray, Jim Hasher. Three votes separate them for the top, but top five are going to go. There are only six in this race. So right now, Sam Oropesa would be the one left off. We'll keep a close eye on that. Last one we're going to check in on special election out in Delaware County, Pennsylvania House District 163. Very important. If Republicans were to take this and take another special election tonight, they could flip control of the Pennsylvania State House. Right now, Democrats in the lead. These are still those early uh, mail-in votes that we're looking at here. And right now, a Democrat Heather Boyd taking about three quarters of those. Still a long way to go in this one. Just about 35% reporting. But that big one we're watching right now, our first lead change in the Philly mayor's race. So that's exciting as, uh, as these votes start to trickle in Natasha. It's a slow trickle. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure that lead will change, uh, you know, throughout the night. But thank you so much, Dan, for the very latest there. We do appreciate that. Again, we've got our reporters scattered all about the city of Philadelphia tonight. They are watching all of the top candidates in the all important mayoral primary here in the city of Philadelphia. It is primary day in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we are on top of all of it throughout the night. Thanks for watching. We are back with you in just a bit. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Be safe, look after yourself, and look after one another. Repeat after me. Apple, table, penny. Apple, um, red. When you tell people he has Alzheimer's, but he's in a clinical study, it's not so hopeless. Yeah. Maybe. You know, it's like, I hope we can just hang in there and, and maybe they'll find something, you know. Ask me again. What season is it? Um, so when, this, uh, when all the leaves down and... I know it's there, but I can't get it. Yeah. And it just kills me. I remember watching Dad interact with the kids and thinking, geez, in five, six years, will he even know who they are? One in 10 Americans over 65 has Alzheimer's disease. Learn more today at brightfocus.org.
Finding heart in every beat. CBS News, Philadelphia. When a child is sick, there's one thing they need. A really big cookie. Welcome to RMHC. We're not big on poking sticks and beeping machines, but we're the best at playing dress up. We think the tooth fairy should travel everywhere. And while hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be. Welcome back, everyone. There are four questions on the ballot. This one certainly garnering lots of attention right now. Should the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter be amended to create the office of the Chief Public Safety Director and to define its powers, duties, and responsibilities? The director would coordinate the use of resources such as personnel and equipment within various city departments such as the police and fire departments. This measure was spearheaded by City Council President Daryl Clark and was unanimously passed passed by council. This person would be appointed by the mayor, but subject to city council approval. So here is where the vote on that all important question stands. This would be an unprecedented new position created in the mayor's cabinet. And right now with the votes that are in so far, 61 0.6% ultimately are voting yes on this 38% voting no but again this is all about adding another public safety tier to a city that is already dealing with high crime and gun violence many people obviously seeing this as a possible solution some way of possibly curbing the violence that we're seeing here in the city of philadelphia so we will see how voters continue to vote on this particular measure now housing is a big issue as well in the city of philadelphia availability affordability and the crisis of homelessness that is pervasive cbs3 partnered with the philadelphia association of black journalists for a mayoral candidates forum back in april here is what the candidates had to say about housing in the city Imagine every piece of vacant land owned by the city in the land bank being built and towards a goal of 30,000 affordable units in the city of Philadelphia that students in our school district of Philadelphia are being trained by skilled workers from the building trades to build those houses. And guess what? They're not tiny houses that some have proffered as a solution for homelessness or the opioid uh, crisis. They're mixed use. They're also not high high-rise buildings or uh, home, homes that are concentrated uh, with people who are low to moderate income people. See, when you grow up in poverty, we call those high-rises in projects, and we know that they don't work. As mayor, I will <clears throat> bring the departments and the agencies together and say, we, what are the pain points in this process? Why is it taking so long? And we have to make this faster because we have people that need affordable housing. We own 8,500 city-owned vacant lots and properties. We need to put those into use. So absolutely, uh, there is a way to fix it, and I will do that as mayor. This idea came from Jennifer Rodriguez from the Hispanic Chamber. I want to give her credit for that. She said to me, we need an application tracker in the city that could tell people the status of all their projects, the status every two weeks of what's going on, and then we need to look at all of our services we provide and put time frames on them. It's unacceptable not to have a time frame to open a restaurant in 60 days, to get a zoning change in 90 days. We should have time frames on everything, and I learned this lesson in council when we did the outdoor dining. We put a requirement that the city had to approve every application in three days. 862 applications were approved in three days to the city's credit, so it can be done. Our plan includes giving a minimum of the first year in our city budget, $100 million to PHA to build on this 8,500 lots. Might I add, building union. PHA is doing a fantastic job over on Ridge Avenue. They are transforming that community. So that's what our plan is, $100 million the first year and $50 million a year um, moving forward to build, to end this housing shortage. These guys, they, they were in city council. They were in charge of the land bank. Le the city council invented the land bank. Land goes in, nothing goes out. Some of the most blighted properties in our city 
are city-owned properties. That land bank should be closed down and all of those, I think it's 8,800 properties, all that could be used for affordable housing should be sold to black and brown developers so they could build their development business over and enter in a long-term arrangement for affordable housing. Mr. Brown, you don't have an understanding of actually how we direct a real city-led vision for affordability in an, in an environment in which market forces destroy black and brown communities because this is pie in the sky to think that the market will just fix everything for us and that you'll turn it over. The land bank has a vision and it should be executed and it should have been better. I personally believe the first thing I would start off with is an extraordinary amount of transparency. Where is the land? How do you apply? How do we move it through? Who's got applications in? And I do believe that shining the light of day on how we actually move properties is going to help us reform. It's, a, you know, it's, it's an area that nobody understands right now. All right, you are hearing there from a mayoral debate from earlier in the month, last month actually, there are the candidates talking about the housing crisis here and what they would do for homelessness and also creating more affordable housing. Of course, we are staying on top of the very latest here in the mayoral primary in Philadelphia, primary day throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and all of the elections that are happening today, bringing you the very latest here on CBS News, Philadelphia voters decide. We're back with you in just a moment. Stay with us. We know this place by heart. What makes it tick? What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey, Delaware, down the shore, we care as much as you do. CBS News, Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Why is just a starting line? For the true self blooms. Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Jim Thompson was an extremely successful man who touched many lives during his distinguished broadcast career. Jim was president of the Broadcast Foundation of America. The foundation has distributed millions of dollars to colleagues who are facing life's most difficult challenges. And the foundation has created a special fund in honor of his work. To make a donation in his name, simply visit the foundation website at www.broadcastersfoundation.org. Look inside any house and you'll find poison risks hidden in plain sight. More than 90% of poisonings happen at home, but there are things you can do to keep your family safe. Visit the Poison Help website or call 1-800-222-1222, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Diseases and injuries that damage the brain can cause severe mood and emotional changes, known as neuropsychiatric symptoms. While not often talked about, these symptoms are common in people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, Parkinson's and MS, as well as brain tumors, infections, and injuries. Neuropsychiatric symptoms take an enormous toll on everyone involved. The good news is that together we can shake the stigma by talking about them and recognizing them as medical conditions that can be effectively treated. We know this community by heart. CBS News, Philadelphia. All right, welcome back, everyone. We are getting the very latest numbers now in on the mayoral primary here in Philadelphia. You can see Sherelle Parker there taking a slight lead over Rebecca Reinhardt, and you can see Alan Dom there still in third place, followed by Helen Gim. Again, the night is still young, uh, just about 24 percent of precincts reporting at this point so still many many more votes to be counted and more results to filter in throughout the evening now some breaking results coming in as well on that state house race this is a race that everyone around the commonwealth is really really looking at it could ultimately control or figure out who's going to control have the balance of power and control 
there in the state house. So let's check in with Dan Snyder. He's watching the returns there as it relates to the state house. What's happening? Yeah, Natasha, big update out of central Pennsylvania. The Associated Press is calling that race for Michael Stender, the Republican there. That means as we sit right now, the state house is deadlocked. Republicans, Democrats, they're in a dead heat. So this race, the special election for state house district 163 in Delaware County, this is going to decide who controls the state house. Right now, Democrat Heather Boyd, She's doing pretty well. She's got 76% of the vote. Republican Katie Ford there at 22.2%. Democrats did spend a good amount of money on this race, so they knew this was going to be important. The one in central Pennsylvania, that is a Republican hold. Democrats need this to stay a Democratic hold. We're going to continue to watch it throughout the night. Natasha. All right, we'll definitely be watching that very, very closely. Dan, thank you so much. Now let's bring back in political analyst Eleanor Desi. She has a long career in the political arena, working in the mayor's office of neighborhoods under Wilson Good, among other jobs. And also analyst Joe Watkins, who has also had a lengthy career in politics as well, working on the Bush Quail campaign and serving in leadership roles in many charities and nonprofit organizations. Eleanor and Joe, thank you so much for joining us on another election night tonight. So tell us what your thoughts are about what you're seeing. We're just getting some of the polls coming in now. Some of the uh, precincts reporting 24% or so. Kind of a flip-flop here between Reinhardt and Parker. Still very close and too close to call. So what are your thoughts just about where things stand right now? I, I thought for sure that uh, uh, that uh, if there was a strong black turnout that Cheryl Parker would do very well tonight. And uh, so far it's looking like she's, uh, she's strong, uh, certainly at this vantage point. Uh, uh, strong, very, doing very, very well. Um, that her voters uh, showed up to vote. Um, uh, you can't count out, of course, Rebecca Reinhardt. Uh, she's also equally strong. And, uh, and it looks like her voters have turned out as well. So we'll just have to see what happens as the night goes on. I wouldn't count out uh, uh, Helen Gim or Alan Don for that matter, but especially Helen Gim, because uh, I, I think certainly among, well, Eleanor said earlier, among young progressives, she's been very, very popular. So right. we'll see what happens as, uh, as the night goes on. And Eleanor, you were talking about this earlier with Helen Gim and Reinhardt and how they're, they may be kind of, you know, bringing out yes. different, dem different demographic of progressives. Yes throughout this polling today. So tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are just about who they're bringing to the polls. Well, what I had heard was a lot of the progressives in Philadelphia were torn because they, they felt that they identified with Rebecca, with uh, some of her strong financial background and with education being the number two issue, Helen had a strong backing with the young progressives. So the young progressives are probably, you know, have children in the schools and what have you so education is really very important for them but the older progressives are very concerned about the financial stability of the city of philadelphia and i think they went with rebecca now what the numbers we're seeing natasha we don't know exactly where they're coming from at this point but we think that probably we're seeing some center city votes and that's where we think that uh, rebecca and um, and Helen will do well. Uh, the set, uh, probably the fifth and the eighth wards, the fifteenth ward, the thirtieth ward. I think that's where we're going to see. You know, that that's where their presence will be. I I'm, I'm waiting to see where the northwest wards come in. The ninth, the twenty-second. That's the stronghold. That's for uh, Sherelle. That will be uh, where she will probably do very well. That is where she had a lot of support from Congressman Dwight Evans and from former Councilwoman Marianne Tasco. And um, so it, it, we don't know if the Northwest has come in yet. And of course, we're still waiting to see some of those mail-in ballots. But I do, what I did hear today, talking to some people when I was down in South Philadelphia, was that they said that a lot of the um, progressives, especially the young progressives, they want to go vote in person. But the older progressives, they like the mail-in ballots. So this is maybe where we're seeing um, the Rebecca Reinhardt in the second place and Helen not, you know, the, the, the mail-ins are being counted already, but the wards have not been counted. So we might see Helen bump up a little bit. Yeah, so the in-person vote could make all yes. the difference. And that's what we're kind of waiting on as it trickles in. We're just also hearing that Sherelle Parker has taken a bit more of a lead now with 
5,500 votes, leading by 5,500 votes over Rebecca Reinhardt. Again, we always knew it was going to be this three-way kind of a race, we thought, yeah. between Rebecca Reinhardt, Helen Gim, and Sherelle Parker. Right now, Sherelle Parker leading by 5,500 votes. Again, it's just uh, 935 or so, 933. <laughs> the night is still young. Still we hope young. very young. young. We <laughs> hope we'll have a winner before the end of the night. But again, uh, this is definitely going to be a close race, and we always knew that from the very beginning. The other thing is, if we don't have results by maybe midnight, um, they might break and send the uh, the people home from the city commissioner's office and they won't start counting until the morning. So let's hope that uh, we, we know something by between 11 o'clock and midnight. Fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> Fingers crossed here. I, like they say, every vote counts, you know, and, and you got to just make sure that you're making sure that every vote is heard. So, uh, and if it's really close, Natasha, remember the overseas ballots, and there will be overseas ballots, you know, military people and people living abroad. They have another seven days for those votes to come in. All right, so again, this could come down to the wire here, and it may yes, not be if decided. It's very close. It may not be decided tonight. So, of course, we're going to keep you guys with us. So, stay right where you are, Joe and Eleanor. We appreciate your perspective on this and getting us through this mayoral primary tonight. Again, a very, very tight race and a race that we are closely watching here on CBS News Philadelphia. We're going to stay on top of the very latest results. Cheryl Parker again with the lead at 5,500 votes, but again, so many more votes to come in. Many are trickling in. We're going to give you the very latest as we get more information. Uh, it's a pretty much a three-way race right now. Sherelle Parker on top, Rebecca Reinhardt, Alan Dom was last in third place. Helen Gim, though, right behind him. So still too close to call. Still so many more votes to be counted. And the Tabulation Center in Northeast Philadelphia, all those mail-in ballots are being counted as well. We're going to take a quick break and bring you the very latest when we come right back. Stay with us. safe, look after yourself, and look after one another. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Nearly 100% of children will be infected with respiratory syncytial virus by age two. Symptoms can be like a common cold. However, it can be life-threatening. Trouble breathing or dehydration are signs of severe illness. RSV is the leading cause of hospitalization of all infants. Contact your healthcare provider if symptoms worsen. Visit lung.org slash RSV to learn more. When a child is sick, there's one thing they need, a really big cookie. Welcome to RMHC. <laughs> we're not big on poking sticks and beeping machines, but we're the best at playing dress up. We think the tooth fairy should travel everywhere. And while hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Hi, good evening, everyone. 
I'm Yuki Washington. I'm Jessica Cartalia. It is primary election day in Pennsylvania. The polls closed at 8 o'clock. And results are coming in fast now. Let's take a look at the Democratic race for mayor. We had our first lead change about 25 minutes ago when votes for Sherelle Parker took the lead over Rebecca Reinhardt. Here's how it stands right now with 30% of precincts reporting Rebecca Reinhardt with 31.8% over Rebecca Reinhardt. She's in the lead by about 5,400 votes. A special election in Delaware County will likely decide if Democrats keep control of the state house. Republican Katie Ford, Democrat Heather Boyd, and Libertarian candidate Alfie Goodwin are trying to fill the seat of former state representative Mike Zabel. Boyd is leading. And once again, we have a long way to go tonight. Our primary election coverage continues throughout the evening and on air and streaming online. We'll see you back here in an hour with the latest results. Good evening. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Natasha Brown, and you are watching CBS News Philadelphia. Voters decide on this primary day in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, here in Philadelphia, that big mayoral primary that we are following very, very closely. When you ask residents here in the city what is the biggest issue facing our city, most will most certainly tell you it is gun violence, public safety, crime during a mayoral candidates forum hosted by CBS News Philadelphia and the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. We asked the candidates about their personal blueprint for change. I would establish a state of emergency that would bring in all communities, all relevant agencies, including um, not only all levels of law enforcement, but our our public health, um, our school district, SEPTA, um, and many other actors to come together to have an all, all hands on deck effort. We're going to, to be creative. We're going to ban ski mask day one. We're going to address these open bench warrants uh, for the repeat violent offenders because they're running our streets with ski mask on, terrorizing each and every one of us. We're living in fear and we should not live this way. I don't care where you are in the city. There is no one who is going to tell me that I don't have a right to have criminal justice reform and zero tolerance for any misuse and or abuse of authority by law enforcement without having those 300 officers specifically engaged in what I reference as community policing. In the short term, I plan to coordinate the city departmental response through the emergency operation center. That's police, that's streets for lighting, that's all the departments on day one. Uh, I also plan to use the specific intervention strategies that have been shown to work in other cities. Cognitive behavior therapy, group violence intervention. Uh, th these are strategies that work. I organized the public safety cabinet myself. I did not keep it uh, in the public eye. I kept it under the radar. I had the DA there, U.S. Attorney, Attorney General's Office, FBI, ATF. We had a few meetings with courts. We had eight or nine meetings, and it concluded when I left council. But I would engage on day one uh, this public safety cabinet. Our plans are the plans that make sense. And let me start out by saying every police organization in this city the local police, the Temple Police, the Penn Police, the SEPTA Police, the, the uh, Guardian Civic League, the black police officers, every single one endorsed me. We well, you know polls have shown the Democratic mayoral primary to be a very, very tight race. We're seeing that play out right now as we get some of the returns in tonight. Let's check in with our Dan Snyder. He's watching the return. So what's the latest right now, Dan? Yeah, Natasha, big update within the last few minutes here. A nice batch of in-person uh, votes coming in, about 17,000 of them here. And it was a really good batch for Sherelle Parker. She expands her lead. Last time we checked in, she had about a 64 vote lead on Rebecca Reinhardt. That is now almost 5,500. So this was a really, really good batch of Sherelle Parker votes. Rebecca Reinhardt still very much in this, but again, in that second tier now. And Helen Gim actually jumps Alan Dom by about 40 votes here. So really a pretty clear line of separation between Reinhardt and Gim, but Gim has been climbing a little bit. And Jeff Brown, you can see he's just kind of at the same spot right now. And I think we just got actually another update. Yeah, Sherelle Parker is expanding that lead even further. Live update for us right here. She now holds a 9,000 vote lead over Rebecca Reinhardt in this race. So Sherelle Parker, these last couple batches that have come in, uh, come in have been really, really good for her. Where she's doing really well right now, North Philly, West Philly, 
Southwest Philly. Those have been heavy Sherelle Parker districts. You talk about Rebecca Reinhardt. She's looking good in Center City and in South Philly and up here in the northwestern part in the uh, uh, Maniunk Roxborough area. And Alan Dumb has been doing well in Northeast Philly right now. But Sherelle Parker uh, just again about a minute ago expanding that lead out to 9000 votes over Rebecca Reinhardt. Helen Gim also gaining a little bit there. Let's take a look at those city council races as well. Again, these are Democrats who are being challenged in this primary. Ketsi Lozada, she is holding on to her seat in District 7 right now. District 8, Cindy Bass, she expands her lead out a little there. She's trying to hold that seat. And in District 9, Anthony, uh, Anthony Phillips is holding his seat as well. We're going to continue to follow these numbers, and they're coming in quicker. Natasha, let's get things back to you. All right, thank you very much, Dan. We'll get back to you shortly. Now, this has been a very close race, as we've been saying. No clear front runner just yet, even though Sherelle Parker does seem to be edging closer and closer to more toward more of a lead here. Let's bring in Lauren Cristella now, president of the Committee of 70. Thank you so much again for taking time to help us break down the race tonight and some of the results that we're seeing so far. Are you at all surprised to see Sherelle Parker at this point, at least kind of pulling ahead of the pack? No, and I think we might see things continue to shift as more pockets of votes come in across the city. Uh, but I am not surprised to see Sherelle uh, Parker doing so well. She had more than two times the next candidate's support among uh, black and brown voters in Philadelphia. And uh, I think we're seeing that start to play out. Yeah, and we were talking of just about the, you know, this being the Phillies mayor's race being the most expensive in the city's history, some $21, $31 million being spent. Uh, and Alan Dom spending the most, of course, of his own money, ultimately, in lots of ads and political campaigning. Uh, does I guess it doesn't really matter, or does it matter how much money you spend? It doesn't always, you know, translate into a win in the end. Exactly right. Uh, I think money does not hurt, that's for sure. Um, and it definitely brings name recognition and uh, message awareness. But it is not the ultimate decider. I think people will take a look at all the candidates, regardless of uh, how many times they're necessarily seeing their message on TV, and, and pick the candidate that aligns with their values. Yeah, and we were hearing that in some of the, the wards where they're used to heavy voter turnout, it really hasn't been a, a steady, heavy stream, or it hadn't been earlier tonight during the polling hours. Does that surprise you that, you know, despite the fact that there's been this media blitz from these candidates, uh, nine of them ultimately, five pretty much doing, doing the best at this point, but does it surprise you that people still didn't get out to vote? It doesn't necessarily surprise me. We always see uh, lower turnout in municipal elections like this. Uh, I am disappointed. We worked very hard to, to get out the vote and inform and engage voters across the city. Uh, but we have not cracked the code on why 70% of voters turn out for presidential elections and we might hit 30% in this mayor's race. Yeah, and tell us what the Committee of 70 did do to try to get out the vote as much as possible. It was a beautiful day today, so you couldn't blame it on the weather today. No, certainly couldn't blame it on the weather. We, uh, our primary voter engagement uh, program is called the We Vote Initiative, where we partner with businesses, universities, uh, nonprofits, religious organizations across the entire Commonwealth, but certainly across Philadelphia to work with their leadership and inform, uh, provide nonpartisan resources so that these trusted messengers, employers, community leaders can share our resources with their community and, and really promote a culture of voting because we know that when it's part of the culture and people make it easier and, and make it easier to be informed, uh, you'll see increased turnout. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know the vote count is continuing at this hour and certainly will be probably throughout the night. So we will bring you much more on the very latest here in the mayoral primary race in Philadelphia. Overall, the races here in the state of Pennsylvania tonight on this primary election night. I'm Natasha Brown. We're going to take a quick break. We're back in just a moment. know this place by heart. What makes it tick? What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey, Delaware, down the shore, we care as much as you do. CBS News, Philadelphia.
finding heart in every beat. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Why is just a starting line? For the true self blooms. Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Jim Thompson was an extremely successful man who touched many lives during his distinguished broadcast career. Jim was president of the Broadcast Foundation of America. The foundation has distributed millions of dollars to colleagues who are facing life's most difficult challenges. And the foundation has created a special fund in honor of his work. To make a donation in his name, simply visit the foundation website at www.broadcastersfoundation.org. Look inside any house and you'll find poison risks hidden in plain sight. More than 90% of poisonings happen at home, but there are things you can do to keep your family safe. Visit the Poison Help website or call 1-800-222-1222, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Diseases and injuries that damage the brain can cause severe mood and emotional changes, known as neuropsychiatric symptoms. While not often talked about, these symptoms are common in people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, Parkinson's and MS, as well as brain tumors, infections, and injuries. Neuropsychiatric symptoms take an enormous toll on everyone involved. The good news is that together we can shake the stigma by talking about them and recognizing them as medical conditions that can be effectively treated. We know this community by heart. CBS News, Philadelphia. All right, getting the very latest vote count at this point with 38% of precincts reporting. Sherelle Parker widening her lead at this point with 33% of the vote. Rebecca Reinhardt at 22%, Helen Gim at 16%, and Alan Dom at 14.5%. Again, this 38% of precincts reporting, still votes trickling in to be counted. Still, of course, the tabulation center in Northeast Philadelphia counting mail in ballots. So, still a long way to go. Go, but Sherelle Parker widening her lead at this point. Now, we just heard also from the Republican mayoral candidate David O a short time ago. Of course, he is running uncontested. He spoke to supporters at a bar in Northeast Philadelphia. O ran unopposed in today's primary, and tonight he says he is confident that he can win when he faces the victorious Democrat in November. We're going to bring out all the people that are going to shock this city with your power of the vote. It's nothing like they think it is. And, and their time of not counting everyone will be over after November 7th, when we win this election, they will understand you listen and you serve everyone in our city because you cannot divide us. We cannot be divided to be a great city. We have to be united. Well, o, who resigned from city council in February to run for mayor, faces long odds at this point. Registered Democratic voters outnumber Republicans 7 to 1 in Philadelphia. Meantime, an empty coffee can played a major role in this year's primary election. It's a Philadelphia tradition that dates all the way back to nearly a half a century. Photojournalist Brad Now was there in mid-March when the process began. He shows us why putting a hand in the can can be helpful on election day. But be patient, we'll get through the ordinary course of business first, and then we'll get to the ballot draw forthwith. So thank you. We're in a new room, that's fine. New candidates, that's fine. But as long as that same old coffee can and those same old balls are there, the tradition continues. The draw for ballot positions for the May 2023 primary election. Philadelphia politics is interesting, chaotic at times, and yet has a tradition that goes back many years. 
My name is Al Taubenberger. I've been involved in Philadelphia politics all my adult life. We'll have the opportunity to draw a lot to determine their ballot position for that office. Well, that is one of the most interesting traditions we have in the city of Philadelphia, that the ballot positions are actually picked out of a coffee can. We're going to start with Maria Quinones Sanchez. Number nine. It's always been pulled out of a coffee can, which actually, by the way, is a Horn and Hardard's coffee can, which goes way back. Derek S. Green. Number six. Alan Dom. Number 11. Jeff Brown. Number eight. What do you think of that tradition? Interesting, and it works. Helen Ginn. Is Helen Ginn present or a proxy for Helen Ginn? Okay, civil service employee will pick for Helen Ginn. Number 12. Why does it work? Well, it's a fair way to do it. You shake the can up, everybody sees it, and you can look in the can. It's not like there's things in there already. It's just a great way to, to do it if, if the people want to continue it. Number 16, number 17, number 11, number 10. It's packed. People want to know what the hell's going on. Number nine. Number 13. Register of wills. It is a happening, and, and it would be in other places, too, if, if they did anything like what we do. But the fact is, that's where the ballot positions are um, picked. Number 13. Number 20. Number one. Well, number one has always been uh, revered. It, it, it has a, a lot of potential winners in it. Uh, it doesn't always, but it can. And, uh, of course, you could do the opposite. If you're last on the ballot, you could play that up, too, you know, depending where you are. Number one. So you don't think it's time to kick the can down the road? No, I don't. It's fun. You know, as long as people still think it's fun and it's done fairly, the can should stay. So council at large, number 22. All right, let's give you the very latest on the vote count at this point with 38% of precincts reporting. Sherelle Parker widening her lead with 33% of the vote at this point. Rebecca Reinhardt with 22%. Helen Gim with 16%. And Alan Dom with 14.5%. So this was always expected to be a tight race among these four candidates ultimately. And it's certainly looking to be that way, even though Sherelle Parker is widening her lead, especially doing well in North Philadelphia and West Philadelphia, which is no surprise. She is a West Philly native. So, of course, we're going to stay on top of the very latest results here on CBS News Philadelphia. Our coverage of primary election night 2023. Voters Decide will continue for you in just a moment here on CBS News Philadelphia and on CW Philly. Hey there, everyone. I'm meteorologist Bill Kelly with a quick look at your weather. The high temperatures today. How beautiful was it? Hope you had a chance to get out and enjoy all the sunshine in the morning. Clouds thickening on up. They're going to be gone for tomorrow. And we're talking about a big difference in temperatures. We got to 79 officially here in Philadelphia. 81 for Wilmington. Started with an 8 in Reading as well, right at 80 degrees. It was 78 today for Millville and Dover down the shore. Same thing, upper 70s to near 80 degrees. The trend tomorrow, big difference. We're going to drop back down into the 60s. Normal high temperature this time of year is mid 70s. So a little bit below. Certainly not record levels or anything like that, but 68 for your Wednesday, 69 degrees on your Thursday. Then we gradually go right back up again by Saturday, 75. That's when we're tracking our next weather maker, by the way, Saturday. And then Sunday and Monday, we'll be pushing that 80 degree mark again. So three things for you to know tonight. The rain stays mainly south of our area, and it's going to be continuing to move on through. Those clouds are going to be breaking up as well. It is cooler but sunny through midweek and into the end of the week as well. And then last but not least, we are tracking our next weather maker for you, and that is this upcoming Saturday. So for tonight, 56 degrees, mainly cloudy skies, a stray shower off to the south. Winds will be out of the northwest 5 to 10. They are switching southwest early, switching on over to the northwest. And then as we look at the temperatures tomorrow, because of the northwest winds, which by the way, will be a little on the breezy side. We're talking about sustain probably 10 to 20 miles per hour, gust 25, maybe a little bit more. That's going to hold these numbers down and a very small temperature difference between the morning and the afternoon, starting out in the upper 50s, mid to upper 50s, ending up in the mid to upper 60s. Then Thursday, Thursday morning, mark it in your mental calendar. It's going to be a chilly start, 46 to get you going, 60s in the afternoon. And then looking ahead, we got 73 on your Friday, tracking some showers on Saturday. By Sunday, we're trending drier with a temperature of 78. We know this community by heart. 
We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. How prepared is your family if a hurricane shows up at your doorstep, or a flood, or a blizzard? You can't just turn away a natural disaster. That's why it's important to go to ready.gov slash plan now. It has the tools and tips you need to make an emergency plan with your family. So if disaster comes knocking, let's go. You'll be ready to help keep your family safe. It's just a pizza. Yes. Make a plan today. Why is just a starting line for the true self blooms? Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Hey world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight. Both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. We're not in your hand trying to text somebody back. Because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Uncovering the heart behind the headlines. CBS News, Philadelphia. Did you know that more than 90% of poisonings happen at home? Look closely and you will find poison risks hidden in plain sight inside every house. But there are actions you can take to keep your family safe. Identifying and eliminating poison risks can protect your family from accidental poisonings. Visit the Poison Help website for tips on preventing poisonings in your home or call 1-800-222-1222, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When a child is sick, there's one thing they need, a really big cookie. Welcome to RMHC. <laughs> we're not big on poking sticks and beeping machines, but we're the best at playing dress up. We think the tooth fairy should travel everywhere. And while hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be. From the heart of Philly, this is CBS News. It's election day in PA. More than ever, people need to come out. At stake, control of the PA House. I came here hoping that there is a damn change. In Philly, there is a crowded field of Democrats in a razor thin race for the nomination. I think we could be looking at a few thousand votes being the deciding factor. Not leaving any vote to chance, each Democratic candidate crisscrossed the city. It's been a tough choice, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Our crews monitoring the election task force. Under no circumstances will we tolerate interference or intimidation. And staying on top of mail-in ballot issues, knowing... You vote and you make a difference. You're not going to get anything done if you don't speak up and have a voice. If you don't vote, you don't get to complain. Our voters decide. Coverage starts right now.
Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Natasha Brown. It's 10 p.m. and we are streaming live on CBS News Philadelphia. We want to welcome our CW Philly viewers as well to our special coverage on this election night. Now we are monitoring the race that could change the state house. The big ballot question about creating a public safety director position in Philadelphia. We've got reporters with the leading Democratic candidates for mayor as well. So where do those results stand at this hour? Let's check in now with Dan Snyder. He's got the latest. Dan. Yeah, Natasha, we just got another batch of ballots in and Sherelle Parker continues to expand her lead in the Democratic mayoral race. She now has an 11,000 vote advantage over Rebecca Reinhardt, who's sitting in second. These two have been at the top of the race the entire night, but really it's been the last three batches of votes we got in that saw Sherelle Parker overtake Reinhardt and then continue to expand that lead. Also, interestingly, Helen Gim continues to come up. It's been slower for her, but she jumped in front of Alan Dom on that last batch, and now she's separating herself from Dom and getting ever so closer to Reinhardt. We're at about 100,000 votes in in the mayor's race right now on the Democratic side, and Sherelle Parker continues to expand that lead now at more than 11,000 over Rebecca Reinhardt. So her supporters have to be happy right now, but as you can see, about half reporting, so we still have got a long way to go. Natasha, let's get back to you. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Well, speaking of Sherelle Parker, our Alicia Roberts is live at her campaign headquarters at the Laborers Local 332 in the Spring Garden section of Philadelphia with the very latest from the Parker campaign. Certainly sounds like a party atmosphere there, Alicia. I guess they're getting word of some of these numbers right now. And the crowd loving those updates that you're hearing, Natasha. The party is on here. We've got the uh, DJ going. They are saying right now that Sherelle Parker is the mayor of Philadelphia. That is, that is what we are hearing right now live. Again, we're still waiting. So you're hearing this update live as we are right now. The team for Sherelle Parker is saying that she has won the Democratic nomination for mayor again. The crowd celebrating that news as you can hear behind us now. Again, some of those votes still coming in, but they are celebrating here at Sherelle Parker's camp. You can see the music going, the balloons. The crowd has gathered here. Sherelle Parker saying earlier today that she felt confident in the turnout here. Her campaign officials saying the more people that came out for in-person voting would be a good thing for Sherelle Parker's camp. We've seen some pretty prominent politicians across our region here tonight, including Senator Sharif Street, who is the head of the Pennsylvania Democratic Committee. Again, here tonight, breaking on air, Sherelle Parker's campaign is saying that she has won the Democratic nomination for mayor. Her campaign celebrating now. They are on the dance floor. They are claiming victory. We are expecting to hear from Sherelle Parker tonight live. We are told she will be addressing her voters, those that came out to support her. Natasha, we will be carrying that for you live here. We'll send it back to you. All right, hearing that live there from her campaign already claiming victory tonight, Alicia. We do appreciate that update and we'll certainly be getting back to you when we get more official word as well. Now let's head out to Carrie Carrado, who's at Rebecca Reinhardt's campaign headquarters at Craft Hall in Northern Liberty tonight. She's got the latest from her campaign right now. So how are things looking and feeling out there, Carrie? Hi, Natasha. That's right. We are at the Rebecca Reinhardt campaign at Craft Hall on Delaware Avenue. We have the stage, we have the balloons, and we have a lot of her supporters here patiently waiting. A lot of them filtering in throughout the night, even Rebecca Reinhardt herself. So here's the moment she walked in. A lot of her supporters were uh, chanting, they were yelling for her, and she even took the time to mingle with her supporters. And she has a lot of them here, I can tell you that. Everyone is on edge of their seats. It's exciting and tense at the same time. Now, Earlier today, Reinhardt voted at the 10th Presbyterian 
church in Center City this morning. You can hear all of them cheering behind me. They said there's still hope. A lot of them uh, just patiently waiting. The former city controller said she was feeling really good and confident in the voters today. She says she is the person to lead this city with change throughout this critical time. Overall, the excitement is growing. Everyone is crossing their fingers here, knowing this is a toss-up, knowing it's extremely uh, close and many votes still need to be counted. Right now, you can hear them uh, chanting Rebecca, so uh, they know there's still a lot of votes to be counting, and the excitement is still high. Everyone patiently waiting and watching those results on the screen. We're live tonight. Kerry Corrado, CBS News, Philadelphia. Back to you. All right, Kerry, thank you very much for that update there from the Reinhardt campaign. Now let's head out to Seattle Lewis. He is live at the Allen Dom campaign headquarters. He's at the Continental Midtown in Center City with the latest there. See Alpha, good evening. Hey, Natasha, we are at the Continental Midtown Chestnut and 18th Streets here in, uh, in Center City, of course. If you're wondering why, it's because Alan Dom is an investor in the Steven Star Restaurant Groups, thus the connection. That's why we're here at the Continental. Now, about 20, 25 minutes or so ago, Alan Dom entered the party to raucous applause. We actually have some video to show you of the crowd, which I am currently facing, so you can't see it. But here is a, a bit of the crowd here at the Continental. Very festive party-type atmosphere. You might think you're out for, for drinks with a bunch of friends on a Friday night. It's a quaint party, of course, but still a very festive atmosphere. I also spoke to an Alan Dom supporter to find out why he is supporting Alan Dom. Alan, he has a, no, a no-nonsense approach when it comes to how he runs his business. So I think if he correlates that, that same approach to politics and, and runs Philadelphia like that, I think he'll clean up a lot of the crime. Um, public safety will be a lot safer um, and education will be better as well. I think he doesn't tolerate a lot of nonsense that goes on in the city right now. And if he's, if he's our mayor, he'll definitely be able to counteract that and run a tight ship. Now, despite the fact that the latest, the latest vote totals have Dom down by about 20 points and 20,000 votes behind Sherelle Parker, and despite what Alicia Roberts reported from the Parker campaign headquarters, you would not get you do not, there's no sense here that this race is over, so they are patiently waiting for all the results to come in. When Alan Dom came in, he addressed all of his supporters, thanked them for their support, thanked them for being here tonight, and said, we're going to have to stick around and hang out for a little bit more until we get all those results. We're sending it back to you right now. Natasha. Yep, more votes have to be counted. Thank you very much, Siafa. We appreciate that update. Now let's head out to Joe Holden. He's live at Helen Gim's campaign headquarters at the Sheridan in Center City for the very latest from the Gim campaign. Joe, how are things looking and feeling out there? Well, let me tell you, Natasha, a couple of things. Let's break down the mood. First of all, it doesn't appear or sound at all like they are ready to pull the plug here at Helen Gim campaign headquarters at the Sheraton Hotel in Center City. That in contrast to what we heard from Alicia Roberts, where there is somewhat of a claim of victory already. We have not heard from Helen Gim just yet, but her supporters are here. And when we talk about mood and tone, it sounds like a bit of a, a loud union meeting. People enjoying themselves, lots of uh, union representation from labor across the board. Of course, Helen Gim enjoys the support of the American Federation of Teachers and a multitude of unions representing laborers in the education system uh, in Philadelphia schools. Now, Helen Gim uh, trailblazed her way into politics as someone framing herself to, to fix broken systemic things, whether it be government or the school district itself, or wiping the school reform commission uh, clear out of town. Again, waiting to hear officially from the campaign, uh, but we did hear from the president of the AFT, Jerry Jordan, in how he sized up the support he thought would propel Helen Gim to the head of the class. How do you think it breaks down? I, I think that Helen wins. I cannot give you percentages uh, because I don't know uh, what they're going to be, but I feel very, very good about Helen's victory tonight. And what, is, what, what pushes her over the top, specifically? Us. us. When I say us, all of us, the, the people in Philadelphia, residents in different communities, unions, different unions, uh, all coming together and listening to the message that Helen has been sharing during the campaign and hoping for a much better Philadelphia. 
So if you follow politics, it has been quite the night already and things shaping up to be a really interesting picture with some camps already claiming victory, albeit unofficial and albeit with only about a third of the votes counted at this point. Again, the headline right now, Natasha, from the Helen Gim campaign, we're not pulling the plug on this party just yet. We'll send it back to you. All right, no concession speech just yet. Thank you so much, Joe. We will get back with you shortly out there. Let's check in now at Jeff Brown's campaign headquarters at the Warwick Hotel in Center City. That's where we find Ryan Hughes live with the very latest there. It's always seemed to be a festive atmosphere there, despite the fact, Ryan, that Jeff doesn't appear to be polling as well at this point. The votes don't seem to be, you know, kind of swaying toward him right now. Yeah, those early results not really going Jeff Brown's way. And despite the loud music, it's been pretty calm and pretty quiet here amongst his supporters. Take a look. Everybody here is in the Grand Ballroom. We are still awaiting the arrival of Jeff Brown. We were told that he would be here around 8.30. That, of course, hasn't happened. We're told he's upstairs surrounded by his family watching as these results come in. So during that time, I've had a chance to speak with many of these supporters who tell me they like the fact that Jeff Brown is an outsider, that he's not a politician, that they're frustrated with city government, and they believe that Brown is the man that is committed to change. So I also did speak with Brown's campaign. Uh, they tell me that he's feeling pretty good and he's also proud of his campaign and the night is not over yet. Let's show you some video because it's been a very busy day for Jeff Brown. Uh, we caught up with him around 8 o'clock this morning as he caught, cast his ballot at the 10th Presbyterian Church. He was holding his wife's hand. He was surrounded by his family and some of his supporters. Then we're told he lent a lunch with his wife, then to an election party at the Pink Cafe. He also visited several polling places in West Philadelphia today. Brown, he, he entered the race last November calling himself the anti-politician. He's a fourth generation grocer. He owns a dozen supermarkets around the area and he has no political experience. But again, talking to many of his supporters tonight, they like that. Take a listen to one supporter on why he wanted to vote for Jeff Brown. And I want to see who best describe like my values, taking make sure that crimes are done in the city, making sure education was a focus of theirs, as well as making sure that safety was a third priority on their list. Jeff Brown hit all those. So again, we are still waiting for Jeff Brown to come into the ballroom and to speak with his supporters. His campaign is watching those results very closely. The early returns not going Jeff Brown's way, but they say the night isn't over just yet. Natasha, back to you. That's right. Every vote must be counted. Thank you so much, Ryan. We appreciate that. Now, this has been a close race. Uh, the front runner at this point being Sherelle Parker, but the votes are still being tallied, still coming in. Let's bring in Lauren Christella, president of the Committee of 70, to talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing so far. You could see there from Parker's campaign, uh, lots of hype there, already declaring her a winner before all the votes are tallied here. I think they got a little overexcited. The the campaign has recently retracted that that declaration, but said that they're feeling very good and, and looking forward to making another one soon. Yeah, and it's all it's always been about you know who could get out the vote. Uh, any election, obviously, it has nothing to do with what we were saying earlier about how much money you put into your campaign. It's about who's going to get people to the polls, who's going to get people to get fired up enough to return those mail-in ballots, if that is the case, and who people really believe can lead this city at a time when it's so necessary. So many big issues out here when it comes to public safety, when it comes to education, uh, you know, housing. So tell me a little bit about what you're hearing and what you think is driving drove uh, voters to the polls today? I, I think it is those endorsements from groups that had strong ground games. Um, you're seeing a lot of ward endorsements went for Sherelle Parker, a lot of union support also there, um, and the organizations that really were knocking doors, working in the communities, uh, encouraging people to get out and vote, especially when it's such a low turnout election, every single vote matters. And I think we're going to see that continue to play out over the course of the night. And you were talking a little bit about how the Committee of 70 really did play a part in at least trying to get people all the information they need to make an informed decision about, you know, voting, your voting places, polling places. Tell me a little bit about how your organization uh, orchestrated that. 
Yes, we have a fantastic tool called uh, the Interactive Voter Guide. It's ballot.70.org. We run this every single election, so twice a year, every year. You type in your address, and you get the ballot that's specific to you, right? So your specific council district, all the way down ballot. Uh, and we connect you with all the resources you need to make an informed decision. We also served as a hub for the Every Voice, Every Vote Project's uh, voter guides that so many groups were, were funded to do this cycle. We had over 40 different voter guides, so depending on what issue care, you cared about, you could find each candidate's answers uh, to those questions. Yeah, and what are your thoughts just overall about the fact that, you know, we're seeing some pockets of the city that did see a uh, pretty steady voter turnout today all throughout the day and other pockets that really underperformed, especially like the Roxborough area, which is notorious for heavy voter turnout. That 21st Ward we're hearing kind of underperformed and had, you know, uh, certainly less turnout today than normal. Um, what are your thoughts just about what kept people from the polls? I, I do wonder if the, the large percentage of undecided voters really factored in here. If people were comfortable with a few different voters and didn't um, feel very strongly, uh, either for or against someone, that they just chose to stay home because they didn't, um, they didn't maybe think it was w worth their time. I, I hope not that's not the case, but that per percentage of undecided voters may have played a part there, but I'm really looking forward to diving into the numbers and kind of getting into the community to figure out exactly what was going on there. And we also, I would be interested to see just the demographics that we're dealing with in terms of the voters, like who did turn out, who got the, got out the vote in terms of for Helen Gim possibly, or uh, Rebecca Reinhardt, Cheryl Parker, performing well in North Philly and West Philly, we understand, uh, not surprisingly, She's from West Philadelphia, uh, heavy pockets of black voters in those areas. Uh, so you would think she would be performing well in those areas. But it's going to be interesting to see who really did get the vote out today. Or what are you thinking just in terms of demographics? Lots of younger voters, you think, that may make the difference here? I think absolutely. We, we will see younger, certainly more progressive voters and the impact that they have on the election. Uh, more established vo voters, older voters, ones that are more reliably turning up at the polling place cycle after cycle. Um, I'm really looking forward to diving into all of the, the returns and the data over the next coming days to, so that we can really have a true understanding of who uh, played a factor in this election. All right. Well, do, we do appreciate your time, and we'll get back with you in just a bit there. We thank you for that. Now, we are looking at a live view now of the Tabulation Center. Here it is in Northeast Philadelphia, where workers are counting the ballots. We will be right back with more on tonight's primary. Of course, stay with us. CBS News Philadelphia. Back in a moment. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Nearly 100% of children will be infected with respiratory syncytial virus by age two. Symptoms can be like a common cold. However, it can be life-threatening. Trouble breathing or dehydration are signs of severe illness. RSV is the leading cause of hospitalization of all infants. Contact your healthcare provider if symptoms worsen. Visit lung.org slash RSV to learn more. Why is just a starting line for the true self blooms? Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Finding heart in every beat. CBS News, Philadelphia. Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. You can always find people who are helping. Thank you to all the first responders who put their lives in danger to help us when my brothers and sisters need them. We look out for the helpers because they look out for us. Thank you, first responders! Thank you, first responders! Love you! Be safe, look after yourself, and look after one another.
All right, welcome back everyone. There are four ballot questions as well here in the mayoral primary in Philadelphia on the ballot. Should the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter be amended to create the Office of the Chief Public Safety Director and to define its powers, duties and responsibilities? The director would coordinate the use of resources such as personnel and equipment within various city departments such as the police and fire departments. This measure was spearheaded by City Council President Daryl Clark and was unanimous passed by City Council. Now this person would be appointed by the mayor but subject to city approval and here is where that stands right now. It looks like an overwhelming majority of Philadelphians, 62 percent are voting yes on what would be a newly formed position, an unprecedented position in the mayoral cabinet here in the city of Philadelphia to deal with our rising crime problem. Now polls have shown the Democratic mayoral primary. It is very, very tight, but we do know that one candidate in particular is widening her lead. Let's check in now with our Dan Snyder. He's watching the returns ever so closely. What are we seeing right now? Natasha, time and time again, we come back to the big board and Sherelle Parker. Her lead grows. In fact, it just grew again as you tossed to me right there. Uh, she's now up 13,304 votes over Rebecca Reinhardt. Uh, she is at about two thirds of these votes, uh, one third, excuse me, of these votes right now. 32.9%. Again, 13,000 vote lead over Rebecca Reinhardt. Helen Gim has started to make her move up. She's really closed the gap between herself and Reinhardt, but does she have enough juice left in the tank to clear? 17,000 votes between her and Sherelle Parker. So that is going to be the big question right now. And Alan Dom has kind of fallen off. So really, we're looking at these top three right now. Again, 17,000 votes separating Helen Gim and Sherelle Parker from third to first place there. So we are watching this very closely. Again, this was just a brand new update in here. Uh, looks like we got about 3,000 votes in that. I'm, I'm sorry, 13,000 votes in that last one, now up to 125,000. So Sherelle Parker continues to widen her lead over Rebecca Reinhardt, over Helen Gim, and stand out on top of this field. Natasha, let's send things back to you. All right, thank you very much. We'll check back in with you in just a bit. Now let's look at one of the big issues facing Philadelphia right now, offering young people programs and facilities to enrich their lives and to keep them off the streets. Many say that rec centers and other facilities and programs can really keep kids safe and out of trouble. Let's hear from the candidates themselves and how they addressed youth programs during our mayoral candidates forum back in April. We have to fund the things that we've done long ago, like rec centers with actual programming, lifeguards and pools. Philadelphia Youth Network that I chaired for a very long time, and, and we helped 200,000 young people get their first internship, never had more than half the funding. I mean, 19,000 children wanted to learn to work, and we funded 9,000 of them, or 9,500. We always didn't invest in children, and we've invested less and less. And now we end ourselves in a situation with violence. We, it's of our own making. And this is a part people don't talk about. It's prevention, it's intervention, and then there's enforcement. But don't forget about the human infrastructure. That's what people like Sherelle Parker, who didn't grow up in the Leave it to Beaver Cosby-like family, that's what I had to depend on at the Recreation Center, the Oak Lane Wildcats, the Philadelphia Flames. We need to support those organizations because they connect with our young people who, for example, are children who have have parents who are incarcerated. I started out working in after school programs and summer camps and that wasn't that long ago and I can honestly tell you children weren't dying when we had access to extended hours in our schools. I ran a program called the Beacon Program and we opened our schools for for the parents and the, fa and the entire family for computer labs, gym, arts and crafts, things in that nature, job training, resume, resume building, and the whole nine. We need those things back. But you, you wouldn't know what worked if you weren't a part of it. And families all across West Philadelphia depended on programs like that. And as your mayor, we would guarantee that we will bring back programs like that. And, and I have to say this. Yes, we have to invest in our rec centers, but have, when the last time you've been to a rec center in West Philadelphia, you can't even fit 10 kids in them. We have to knock them down and make them larger. 
I think we need to increase funding uh, into rec programming, uh, library hours, uh, making sure swimming pools are open Memorial Day to Labor Day in the neighborhoods that have been long neglected. We need to look at services with, through a lens of equity uh, to truly give our kids something to do. My daughter is in seventh grade in the public school system. I know how important the library is in the neighborhood, the rec center, the playground to her. That is what I want for every child in our our city and that is what we need as city controller I worked with Councilmember Gautier stood on the streets in West Philadelphia to urge Mayor Kenny to be laser focused on providing services to the neighborhoods with the most violence rec centers I agree with them I agree have to be open pools have to be open in my education plan I want to teach financial literacy kindergarten through 12th grade I want to teach financial literacy K through 12 including home ownership and entrepreneurship K through 12. And then in high school, I want to take a page out of Cristo Ray and ask those students who are interested, optional, go to school four days a week, on the fifth day, work in a job, get credit, get paid, get a summer job. So that's what I would do, and I think it would really help our young people. Cristo Ray, by the way, last year graduated 99% of their students. 100% of those who graduated were admitted to college. Phenomenal results. This is about the life and the future of the city of Philadelphia. That's why I have spent all my life devoted to transforming the ways that this city actually invests in and treats its young people. Of course it's going to start with schools because that's at the very earliest age where we look at a young person, give them the opportunity to succeed. That's why I am talking about a big investment in modernizing new schools inside and out. I have the I'm the only candidate on this stage with a real plan to actually see that through over the next 10 years. I'm a candidate who understands what schools look like inside the classroom and out. That's why I've talked about every school a community school, every school a hub for families, to bring back parent universities, to guarantee safe passages to and from schools, to make sure that young people are valued in their fulfillment of their potential and not just seen as fodder for jobs or this and that and funneled into whatever position some people think that they can be when they are 16 years old. This city has failed to fulfill the potential of young people. All right, well, let's bring in political analyst Eleanor Desi. She has a long career in political uh, working in the mayor's office of neighborhoods under Wilson Good, among other jobs. And analyst Joe Watkins, who has also had a long career in the political arena as well, working on the Bush Quail campaign and serving in leadership roles in many charities and nonprofit organizations. Eleanor and Joe, thank you so much for joining us. We have appreciated your perspective all throughout this election night. Now we're seeing here that Sherelle Parker is certainly widening her lead as the night progresses, as more and more votes are counted. Eleanor and Joe, what are your thoughts of about that and does that surprise you? Eleanor can tell you that the map and the math really favors Sherelle Parker right now. So Sherelle, uh, as I uh, explained earlier, if she had a good turnout, was in really good position to, to perhaps win tonight and uh, it's looking more and more like she's pulling away from the crowd. It's gonna be harder and harder for the second and third place candidates to ever catch her. But uh, Eleanor can explain that. And yeah. Eleanor, yeah, tell us about that because you can kind of figure out the pockets here where she's gonna possibly gain even more votes at this yes. point. Yes, well, here is the thing. The Democratic City Committee did not endorse a mayoral candidate, but Sherelle Parker was on 45 wards ballots. Now there are 66 wards in the city of Philadelphia. So she was on a significant number of wards uh, all the other candidates, the ones in second, third, and fourth position, they were all had five or six wards endorsing them. So they split up those wards, and that showed that you know these were wards that um, either you know it's where they lived or where they um, you know in, in the case of uh, Rebecca and Helen, there were a lot of um, progressives living there. But Sherelle was on 45 wards, and. She was endorsed by all of the Northeast Ward leaders. Now that was not an area where a lot of people thought that she might do very well, but being on those ward ballots and being supported by the Democratic committee people who are standing at the polls and handing out ballots, that will give her an edge and she will have support in Northeast Philadelphia. Of course, we know in the Northwest, the Northwest Coalition came around and endorsed her strongly and worked hard for her. And she also was the councilwoman in the 9th Councilmanic District, which was part of the Northwest Coalition. That is her strong support. And what we're seeing on the map here is 
that only half of the nor of the ninth councilmatic district vote is in, and with that will absolutely widen her lead. Yeah, and we're talking about the maps. We've had yep. Dan Snyder here checking them for us. What's the right. latest there? What you're seeing the breakdown there, Dan? Yeah, just going off what Eleanor was saying here. This is the ninth district in the city council race. And you can see how much is reporting. I just checked 66 of 163 divisions reporting in this one. So less than half of yes. that is in. And this is uh, Sherelle Parker's old city council district. So you would think this would likely lean heavily in her favor. And yes, if, so Joe and Eleanor, your thoughts here, uh, you know, her campaign out there we saw earlier, they are already <laughs> declaring victory <laughs> a little are. too soon possibly, <laughs> but a maybe they know group. something we don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the, it, it certainly is looking like she is pulling ahead of the pack here and may certainly have the momentum at this point to continue to do that. Yes, and we're going to absolutely watch Northeast Philadelphia and see if the fact that she was supported by the Northeast war leader, that coalition, and on all of their ballots, that could make a big difference for her. They have good reason to be celebrating. That's right. Yeah, and tell me about the ward leaders and how important their role is in any election. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in these off-year elections, especially, they're the ones, they, they, they're in the neighborhood every day, and they're telling their people, come out and vote. And they know who comes out to vote. And so they are a very important part of an off-year election. And as we see, the numbers... We're not, you know, this is not a presidential. We're not seeing numbers like last November when Joe and I were here. We are seeing a low turnout. So they are very important. And the committee people, they are really the backbone of the Democratic Party. They're the ones that drive them out. They're the ones that call their next door neighbor block by block and get those super voters out. And I think that's who we see coming out, the super voters. Yeah, and it's the boots on the ground. I, I think I was driving down Broad Street the other day and saw this huge, you know, truck that had, uh, a, a, I don't know, some kind of monitor, Sherelle Parker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not town, sure. Right. I've never, I mean, I know that's probably, I couldn't miss it, but I'm yeah. certain nobody else could miss it either. So it's little, yeah. little things like that, right? The boots on the ground, the grassroots efforts that really make the difference in the these elections. The ground game makes a difference. Everything. It's still, it it's still personal. There's mail in voting, but it's still a personal contact. And remember, Sherelle's headquarters tonight is at the Laborers Union. Sam Staten, who is the um, head of the Laborers Union, and Sam and I served together on the zoning board, he is a real force. And he had, he was contributing heavily to the ground game. He had all of his union members out there on the street for her. And they, those things make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they certainly do. I mean, it certainly caught my attention. <laughs> Just yes, driving down yes. the street. And we're also looking, we're going to head over here to my right here. This is where uh, Dan Snyder has been kind of breaking things down for us, uh, precinct by precinct, in a sense, different pockets of the city. We talked about the fact that it hasn't been heavy voter turnout, but who got out the vote is what matters most. Right. And, and that's all that really matters. So what are you seeing, Dan? Yeah, so we're just checking out the map from the City of Philadelphia website as those votes come in. And this just kind of breaks it down by those wards, where those wards are leaning where they're voting. You can see this very dark blue. That is all Sorrell Parker. So she's kind of right where we expected her to be, right? North Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia. Those have been her strongholds today. Uh, Eleanor, I think you mentioned the northeast part of the city. That has still been Allen Dom territory up to this point. Uh, so we are just keeping tabs on this. But Sherelle Parker, you can see just very strong in the areas we expected her to be strong. Right. She got those folks to turn out that she needed to turn out. And that's that's huge in any primary election, getting people to the polls to actually cast their ballots. And, and there are the 45 wards that she was on the ballot, Dan. You can see that right, it goes from the Northwest Coalition right down the center of the city, North Philadelphia, out to West Philadelphia and down into Southwest. They are the 45 wards where she was on the ballot. It makes a difference. It absolutely does. And we are continuing to follow the very latest here on the mayoral primary in Philadelphia. Eleanor and Joe, thank you so much. We are back with you in just a moment. Stay with us. by heart. What makes it tick? What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. 
CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey, Delaware, down the shore, we care as much as you do. CBS News, Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Drive, walk, ride, stay prepared with next weather. Did you know that more than 90% of poisonings happen at home? Look closely and you will find poison risks hidden in plain sight inside every house. But there are actions you can take to keep your family safe. Identifying and eliminating poison risks can protect your family from accidental poisonings. Visit the Poison Help website for tips on preventing poisonings in your home or call 1-800-222-1222, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Why is just a starting line for the true self blooms? Only when we find our purpose. It's a million faces in a mirror and everyone belongs. Find your why for a better us. Diseases and injuries that damage the brain can cause severe mood and emotional changes, known as neuropsychiatric symptoms. While not often talked about, these symptoms are common in people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, Parkinson's and MS, as well as brain tumors, infections, and injuries. Neuropsychiatric symptoms take an enormous toll on everyone involved. The good news is that together we can shake the stigma by talking about them and recognizing them as medical conditions that can be effectively treated. And good evening, everyone. I'm Yuki Washington. And I'm Jessica Cartalia. It is primary election day, now night in Pennsylvania, and more than half of the results are now in. Let's take a look at the Democratic race for mayor. This was a, so to speak, four horse race for the longest time, neck and neck, but that changed a little over an hour ago with 63% of precincts reporting. Sherelle Parker has 32.9% of the vote and she leads Rebecca Reinhardt by almost 15,000 votes. A special election in Delaware County will likely decide if Democrats keep control of the state house. Republican Katie Ford, Democrat Heather Boyd and Libertarian candidate Alfie Goodwin are trying to fill the seat of former state representative Mike Zabel. Boyd is leading. Our primary election coverage continues tonight on air and streaming online. Stay with us for live look ins on the candidates vying to be the 100th mayor of Philadelphia. We'll see you back here at 11 with the very latest results. We know this community by heart. We know what makes it tick. What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning, working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey and down the shore. We care as much as you do. And we are proud to tell our stories. CBS News Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Uncovering the heart behind the headlines. CBS News, Philadelphia. Jim Thompson was an extremely successful man who touched many lives during his distinguished broadcast career. Jim was president of the Broadcast Foundation of America. The foundation has distributed millions of dollars to colleagues who are facing life's most difficult challenges. And the foundation has created a special fund in honor of his work. To make a donation in his name, simply visit the foundation website at www.broadcastersfoundation.org. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. CBS News, Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat.
Well, welcome back, everyone. We just heard from the Republican mayoral candidate David O. A short time ago, he spoke to supporters at a bar in Northeast Philadelphia. O ran unopposed in today's primary, and tonight he says that he is confident that he can win when he faces the victorious Democrat in November. We're going to bring out all the people that are going to shock this city with your power of the vote. It's nothing like they think it is. And, and their time of not counting, everyone will be over after November 7th, when we win this election, they will understand you listen and you serve everyone in our city because you cannot divide us. We cannot be divided to be a great city. We have to be united. Well, O, who resigned from city council in February to run for mayor, faces long odds registered Democratic voters outnumber Republicans seven to one in Philadelphia. Now, polls have shown the Democratic mayoral primary. It was expected to be very, very tight, but one candidate in particular is certainly widening her lead, Dan Snyder, has got the latest as he's watching these returns trickle in. Dan, what's the latest? Yeah, I feel like I'm on repeat here, Natasha, but you know, every time we come back to the big board, Sherelle Parker's lead expands just a little bit more. She now owns a 14,600, almost 700 vote lead over Rebecca Reinhardt. Again, Helen Gim, similar to last time uh, we talked, she is closing the gap on Reinhardt, but now down more than 18,000 votes on Parker. So does she have 18,000 votes to gain on Sherelle Parker with what's left out there. That's going to be the big question. Alan Dom has kind of fallen off. So we're looking at these top three right now. Sherelle Parker in a pretty commanding position so far. And one thing to look at for Parker, her old city council seat, we're at only half reporting there. Uh, so there's still probably a lot of Parker votes out there. Anthony Phillips being challenged for that seat right now on city council. He's in a commanding position there in uh, District 9. District 8, Cindy Bass, she is expanding her lead, so she may well be on her way to defending her seat in November. And then in District 7, Ketsy Lozada looking to hold on to that seat. She's got about a 1,000 vote lead over her challenger. How about the at-large? Five of these uh, candidates are going to go 27 on the Democratic side. Just a small 27. Jim Harity would be the cutoff line right now. He's got about a 5,000 vote edge over Aaron Santamore. So Jim Harity would be the last of the Democrats that would slide in at this moment in time. On the Republican side, they've got six. Five will also go there. 87 votes separating the leaders. But again, these two will likely get in. Right now, the cutoff line, Mary Jane Kelly. So Sam Oropesa, if this ended right now, he would be the one left out. And he's about 1,000 votes behind Mary Jane Kelly. Last one, we're going to look at the special election out in Delaware County for State House District 163. And you can see right now Heather Boyd in a good position over uh, Republican Katie Ford. Democrats need to hold on to this seat if they want to hold on to their advantage in the State House. A Republican won in central Pennsylvania today. That brings it to a dead heat. So, Republican or Democrat, this one will decide who owns the state house. Natasha, let's send it back to you. All right, Dan, thank you very much. Well, this was always expected to be a close mayoral primary here, but one a candidate in particular, Sherelle Parker, continues to widen her lead. We understand she may be about to speak to her supporters very, very soon at her headquarters here in the Spring Garden section of Philadelphia. Let's bring in Lauren Christella, president of the Committee of 70. We have appreciated her perspective throughout this election night as well. So we are seeing Sherelle Parker's lead widen here. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing and what we've been talking about, certain pockets of the city where she was certainly able to get out the vote, even on a low voter turnout type of a situation. Yes, she's she's doing a phenomenal job turning out her votes as we kind of predicted from the, the amount of support she had. Eleanor had said earlier about the ward endorsements do play such a role, especially when people are undecided and especially in low turnout elections, right? Those sample ballots that people are handed as they walk into the polls really make a difference. And we know that the mail-in ballots are also still being counted as well. Of course, every vote is going to be counted. That is most important no matter what. Tell me a little bit about the fact how that's factored into our election process now, since more and more people are doing mail-in ballots these days. Yes, it's uh, settling to be about 25% of the vote is, is going to be about consistent in the mail-in voting. Uh, 
method. So that big batch you saw at the front, that was the mail-in ballots that had been uh, primed all day and then were immediately counted when the polls closed at 8 o'clock, run through those high-powered machines. Uh, so that really does give you that early first dose. Uh, it's not necessarily always reflective of the, the whole turnout across the city, but it is an important uh, factor, of course. Yeah, and are, were you seeing more interest, though, just overall, just being out and about and, and driving people to the polls, hoping they get there? Were you seeing more and more interest, though, in this mayoral race? I mean, we've seen a record number of money ultimately being funneled into this election cycle here with this mayoral primary. Also seeing history, possibly, that could be made here if a woman is indeed the candidate tonight who wins. So tell me a little bit about what you were seeing about, you know, those processes playing out. Yes, I mean, I think we saw a ton of engagement. There was unprecedented amounts of forums, candidate forums, voter guides, uh, information sessions happening all across the city. Uh, unfortunately, turnout's not gonna be record breaking. Um, it is on the lower side and it's certainly less than a presidential election, but interest in, the, uh, in this mayor's race and in the, ca the council candidates as well was, was extremely high. All right, Lauren from the Committee of 70, thank you so much for your time tonight. We will get back with you shortly. We do appreciate that. And thank you for staying with us. We're going to continue our coverage. CBS News Philadelphia voters decide in this primary evening in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and here in the city of Philadelphia. We're back in just a moment. Stay with us. While hospitals have doctors and nurses, we have mom and dad. Because at Ronald McDonald House Charities, we help families feel at home, even when they can't be. We know this place by heart. What makes it tick? What makes it different? What makes it awesome? Because we live here too. CBS Philadelphia has been here since the beginning working to uncover the heart behind the headline. From the main line to South Jersey, Delaware, down the shore, we care as much as you do. CBS News, Philadelphia, finding heart in every beat. Diseases and injuries that damage the brain can cause severe mood and emotional changes, known as neuropsychiatric symptoms. While not often talked about, these symptoms are common in people living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, Parkinson's and MS, as well as brain tumors, infections, and injuries. Neuropsychiatric symptoms take an enormous toll on everyone involved. The good news is that together we can shake the stigma by talking about them and recognizing them as medical conditions that can be effectively treated. Brandon met a girl on a dating app. He finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. She must be a keeper. Be safe, look after yourself, and look after one another. We know this community by heart. CBS News, Philadelphia. All right, there were four questions to be decided on the ballot. This was possibly one of the most important. Should the Philadelphia Home Rule Charter be amended to create the Office of the Chief Public Safety Director and to define its powers, duties, and responsibilities? The director would coordinate the use of resources such as personnel and equipment within various city departments, such as the police and fire departments. This measure was spearheaded by City Council President Daryl Clark. It was unanimously passed by council, and this person would ultimately be appointed by the mayor but subject to city council approval. You can see there 61% of voters say yes to creating this new position. Now polls have shown the Democratic mayoral primary. It was set to be a very tight race. We saw it go back and forth just a bit early on, but now it looks to be skewing towards Sherelle Parker, her lead widening. Let's check in and get the latest from Dan Snyder watching the returns for us. Dan. Yeah, a little bit of breaking news right here, Natasha. Alan Dom has just conceded his spot in the race. So Dom, he's out, and you can see 
He's about 30,000 votes behind Sherelle Parker right now. So Alan Dom is conceding. I'm being told that he said he believes the next uh, mayor will be a woman and that he will support whoever wins the race. Uh, on the Democratic ticket, you can see women, your top three right now. Helen Gim at about 18,000 votes behind Sherelle Parker. Rebecca Reinhardt is in second at about 14,600 votes back. So they've got some ground to make up with not a lot of room to do it in. So Sherelle Parker in a very, very strong position in the Democratic mayoral race right now. Another reason for that, District 9, her old city council seat, Anthony Phillips, is fending off two challengers for that seat. And you can see only about 56% in there. So this has been heavily Parker all night. There could still be some Parker votes out there for her. Anthony Phillips fending off those challengers right now in District 8. Cindy Bass, she's doing a good job of holding off her challenger for her seat uh, right now. And in District 7, Ketsi Lozada, she's got a lead on her seat over Andre Sellen right now. In the at-large, Isaiah Thomas leading in the Democratic ticket. We're going to take the first five. That cutoff right now is Jim Harity. He's got about a 6,000 vote edge there. So we'll keep track of this. But for now, let's send it back to Natasha. All right, Dan, thank you very much. Let's bring back in our political analyst, Eleanor Desi, uh, who's also worked with the Wilson Good campaign years ago, among other jobs. Also, we have Joe Watkins, who has also had a long career in the political arena, working on the Bush Quail campaign. Now, you, we guys have been with us throughout the night, looking at these returns live with us. Eleanor and Joe, what are your thoughts here about Sherelle Parker widening her lead and the numbers at this point look to be more in her favor than anyone else. I don't think, I don't think that anybody can catch her right now. I think that uh, the math is going to be too difficult for the other candidates to, to, to catch her. I think uh, Rebecca Reinhardt and Helen Gim, of course, are posting strong numbers, but not nearly as strong as Sherelle Parker's. She's in perfect position to, to win tonight. Yeah, and, you know, it didn't hurt that she was uh, first on the ballot. Uh, that always helps. Um, it, it doesn't win elections, but it certainly helps you get some votes. And I think that that helped her. And she was the first, not only the first on the ballot, she was the first woman. I think this, this made somewhat of a difference. But, and as I said before, she was on 45 ward ballots. That really makes a difference in this kind of election. This is an off year election. You can see that it is, you know, the numbers are not near what the presidential was in November. And yet, $31 million was spent on this. So just, if you break that down, just imagine what each vote cost. Um, and of course, the bulk of that money was spent on TV and, um, and direct mail. And of course, also getting out um, poll workers and what have you. But I think that also, the interest was was in the you know the forums. All right, Eleanor, we are we're going to have to go to a break here, but we're going to continue our coverage. Stay with us on television and streaming. We're back in a moment. Hey there, everyone. I'm meteorologist Bill Kelly with a quick look at your weather. The high temperatures today. How beautiful was it? Hope you had a chance to get out and enjoy all the sunshine in the morning. Clouds thickening on up. They're going to be gone for tomorrow. We're talking about a big difference in temperatures. We got to 79 officially here in Philadelphia. 81 for Wilmington. Started with an 8 in Reading as well, right at 80 degrees. It was 78 today for Millville and Dover down the shore. Same thing, upper 70s to near 80 degrees. The trend tomorrow, big difference. We're going to drop back down into the 60s. Normal high temperature this time of year is mid 70s. So a little bit below, certainly not record levels or anything like that, but 68 for your Wednesday, 69 degrees on your Thursday. Then we gradually go right back up again by Saturday. 75. That's when we're tracking our next weather maker, by the way, is Saturday. And then Sunday and Monday, we'll be pushing that 80 degree mark again. So, three things for you to know tonight. The rain stays mainly south of our area, and it's going to be continuing to move on through. Those clouds are going to be breaking up as well. It is cooler but sunny through midweek and into the end of the week as well. And then last but not least, we are tracking our next weather maker for you, and that is this upcoming Saturday. So for tonight, 56 degrees, mainly cloudy skies, a stray shower off to the south. Winds will be out of the northwest, 5 to 10. They are switching southwest early, switching on over to the northwest. And then as we look at the temperatures tomorrow, because of the northwest winds, which, by the way, will be a little on the breezy side. We're talking about sustained 
probably 10 to 20 miles per hour, gust 25, maybe a little bit more. That's going to hold these numbers down and a very small temperature difference between the morning and the afternoon, starting out in the upper 50s, mid to upper 50s, ending up in the mid to upper 60s. Then Thursday, Thursday morning, mark it in your mental calendar. It's going to be a chilly start, 46 to get you going. 60s in the afternoon and then looking ahead, we got 73 on your Friday, tracking some showers on Saturday. By Sunday, we're trending drier with a temperature of 78.